Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's 30th meeting in 2014? Ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they interfere with broadcasting, even when switched to silent. No apologies have been received. Item 1. The Committee is invited to agree to consider our approach to an LCM on the UK Modern Slavery Bill under Item 5 in private. Are we agreed? Great. Thank you very much. Next item of business is our final evidence session on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2015-16 involving two panels of witnesses. Please Scotland, followed by the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, designate. And I welcome to the first panel meeting uh, from Police Scotland Chief Constable Sir Stephen House, Deputy Chief Constable Neil Richardson and Janet Murray, Director of Financial Services. Thank you very much uh, for attending. I go straight to questions from members. Margaret Mitchell, John Pentland, Alison, mm -hmm. John Finney, Roddy Campbell, Elaine Money. Roddy, what about putting you? Is that, is that a sign you're coming in? It's, Rod, you're coming in. Are you Christian? You're not, yes, Christian, thank you. And Sandra? There we are. There we go. Everybody is in now. Right, where did we start? Margaret, please. Good morning, panel. Um, the figures that we have show that since 2009, some 2,000 support staff have been cut. And when we heard evidence from Steve Diamond of Unison, he stated that not only have the police staff numbers been decreasing, the roles are diminishing. He mentioned in particular licensing and citation serving. Can the Chief Constable comment on the impact on Police Scotland's restructuring of the, the police support staff and the workforce balance? Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm good morning. I'm happy to, to comment uh, on that. I think the, num the numbers are uh, around, about, uh, around about right. Those are, those are two examples. Uh, in terms of uh, citation servers, of course, th this was something which um, was brought in uh, with civilian staff serving citations was brought in in recent years previous to that uh, I'm sure when Neil was an officer I know when I was police officers served citations we've simply gone back to that to that model so police officers are now uh, tasked with serving citations on the licensing uh, situation the, the same applies really uh, and I remember a, a bit of a public concern when police officers stopped doing firearms licensing, for example, and we, we civilianized that because the view was, well, actually, we want police officers doing this. Um, and we're moving back towards that again. Um, quite, quite clearly, what, what, we, what we're doing is working to balance a budget, uh, and one of the ways we've been doing that is... Uh, I wouldn't use the word cutting. We've been obviously we reduced the number of, of civilian staff. We've done it through... Uh, voluntary redundancy and early retirement schemes because obviously we haven't got compulsory redundancy uh, uh, available to us as a, uh, as a as a tool to use so uh, we are reprofiling the organization um, and I believe we're reprofiling it in a cost-effective efficient way and I believe there are operational benefits in some areas as well and I would suggest that certainly the licensing and the citations will lead to police officers who better understand the nature of the community they're working in are able to link things together a lot more. I think the, the, the difficulty with when you have specialist civilians doing it, and they did it extremely well, there's no criticism of that, but when they did it, that was the job that they did all day long. Whereas police officers doing it means that they can actually realize that I'm, I'm going to do a, a firearms licensing check on this address, but actually I know that I was called to a domestic abuse incident here a month ago, and that's a bit concerning. And they can link things together, which it wasn't always so easy for, for civilian staff to do when it comes to things like licensing and indeed citations. So there are some operational advantages to it. I suppose in particular in licensing, there's a certain expertise that was built up with the support staff. It can be quite complex in, in nature. And given that so many crimes are often alcohol-related in, in Scotland, then I think there was some concern that there was a downgrading of, of these staff and, and therefore they were still expected to do some things but not be recognised for it. So perhaps you could address that particularly, uh, Chief Constable, and also also, I think it was the SPA were advoca uh, advocating perhaps the review of the, the workforce balance. Would you be supportive of that? Uh, in relation to the first question, I mean, my, my experience has been police officers doing uh, much of the licensing, particularly the active licensing checks. And I would, with respect to civilian colleagues, say that actually a police officer in uniform going into a licensed premises is far more effective uh, than someone in, uh, in civilian dress 
who's having to identify themselves. So um, I, think, I think there's always room for specialists uh, within the organisation, um, but I do think uniformed police officers do a good job at licensing, and, and, and I think that has been borne out with the reduction in uh, violence across the country. The crime stats out today show a 10% reduction in violent crime across the country, and as you've said yourself, much of that is alcohol-related. In relation to the balance of the workforce, I, th I think this is a much, a much bigger uh, issue. Um, which, which we are addressing now, but I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, when, when the SPA gave evidence, they would have talked about the lead that they're taking in developing the, the, the picture of policing going forward in Scotland, what that will look like, um, what the balance of the workforce will be in that, and we're, we're certainly playing a full part in that, in that discussion with them. Uh, there are some things we know already. We know, for example, we're reducing the number of control rooms down, so we know that picture will look different. Um, but we're also looking at other areas now, such as custody, um, where our custody provisions are. We're looking at criminal justice, which is a very mixed picture across, across Scotland. Uh, as with so many things, bringing the eight forces together, F forces did criminal justice very differently when it came to a, a mix of police officers and police staff. Some were very heavily civilianised, some were not civilianised at all. So that, that's really still settling, settling down. And rather than have any specific target, and we don't have it for the number of civilian staff we would expect to have. What we're doing is asking our heads of units to design the best, the best unit that they can possibly imagine, and we then see what, what, what's the mix of that with police officers and staff in it. So rather than saying there's a target that we are artificially aiming for, instead what we're saying is we're trying to design the best organisation we can, the most cost effective as well and see what that looks like at the end of the day. So there is no specific target that we have in mind around civilian staff, or indeed a balance. So would you favour more devolved budgets to, um, to various parts of the police force? Per pers personally, I, I would, mind. yes. Um, I've worked in a number of police organisations where either the budgets were devolved whilst I was there, uh, or... or were already devolved and, and when, when we say that sort of shorthand for divisional commanders having quite a large proportion of the budget the constraints that we have though are that as, as I think you know from our submission our, our staff costs are about 93 percent something like that 91 percent of our total budget the, the, the biggest proportion of that is 73 percent which is police officers there would be little point uh, in me devolving the budget to divisional commanders when the biggest chunk of it by far is police officer numbers and they can't do anything with police they can't reduce the number of police officers because if they started doing that we wouldn't maintain 17234 so i think in future it's quite possible that the first that we will take steps to devolving more and more of the budget but if you ask divisional commanders the big chunk that they really want to get their hands on is police officers pay uh, and conditions and they would then start dealing with that. that that's where all the money is and there's no point in devolving that and th there is also a question I, i'm just just should, i'll be brief there's also a question around if you devolve the budget to them then they need a finance manager and they need more admin staff to manage their budget locally um, and the same is true with a number of functions and actually most police forces have been going in the opposite direction recently if we could find a way to give divisional commanders the decision making ability around budget and the shape of their workforce locally without the administrative and bureaucratic burden of managing the budget, then that would be, that would be my first choice to do it that way. Okay. One other aspect, if you don't mind, can I else? Uh, for a moment. I think, I think, I think so I've got a big today. list and you can come back in. John Pentland, followed by John Finney, please. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Sir Stephen, the morale within uh, Police Scotland is probably at its all time lowest, and I think this is kind of reflected in the sickness absence which is currently running at 4.2 per cent uh, of working time for police officers and 4.5 per cent for police staff. Now as I said this seems rather high considering that the Labour Force Survey of the Office of National Statistics reports that average rates to 1.6 for men and 2.6 for women. Uh, how can you explain the high rates? Uh, th there's very little I agree with in your question to be honest Mr Pentland. Uh, for the OR, what, where are these figures from so the OR can put them in the reference? The Labour Force Survey from the Office of National Statistics. Yeah, yeah as I okay. say, there's, there's, there's very little I agree with in your, in your question. 
Um, I don't believe uh, that it's possible to measure morale in any particularly scientific way. Um, there's been a huge degree of change in policing in the last uh, two years, the biggest level of change there's ever been. Um, and there's been a certain, certainly been a degree of uncertainty for officers in what the future held for them. That pales into insignificance, of course, with the uncertainty that civilian staff have had because police officers know that they, they have a job uh, and that they will, de they will be deployed. Um, civilian staff were in a much uh, more uh, uncertain position. Um, actually, our measurements show that our sickness absence levels for police officers have, have at worst held steady and in some parts of the country improved in recent years. Um, I think there's, uh, I, I'm not entirely certain what the statistic of 1% that you actually raised was, but it's certainly not a police, a national uh, UK police figure because we are very close to average on that and in some areas beat it. If, it. if it's a national working force figure, then, well, police officers work shifts and they get assaulted by the public all too regularly. Um, and there's no, nobody ever tries to compare police officer absence figures with the normal private sector figure. If it's the public sector, it's a bit of a closer estimate, but again, the vast majority of the public sector don't work shifts. They're not subject to the assault levels or indeed many of the stress levels, which police officers are. So we keep a very close eye, as does the police authority, on our absence figures, and we don't find them out step. So do you, are you then saying you don't think 4.2% sickness absence is, is high? What I'm saying is that it's, it's, not, it's not any higher than it's been under the legacy forces. Um, I think in absolute terms you can say we would want it to be lower. But um, we keep a very close eye on our absence for police officers and I would pay tribute to the men and the women in Police Scotland uh, in terms of their determination to come into work. We have a number of people who are off long term, sometimes through unavoidable illness, who we support, and we have officers who are off long term sick through assaults. And we have a number of people who are off short term, but we have processes in place to try to get them back, as, uh, back to work as fast as, as humanly possible. And I think the organization pays a great deal of focus to that. If, and I'm sure you're aware the police authorities spend a good deal of time looking at it, both at the HR, at the HR subcommittee, but also at their full authority meetings where it's a standing agenda item. Yeah. Again, again, Mr. Uh, uh, Sir Stephen, uh, I take it that you're quite happy with the 4.2 per cent because it's never increased over the, you know, the, from the past couple of years previous that, that you're quite happy with that, with that level of absence. You know, the question again is what are you doing about it to reduce the absence level or sickness level? Well, uh, you know, it appears from, from what I've heard that, that, that perhaps, you know, the, the, uh, the rates are higher even for local policing. So, you know, if morale, is, as you say, is perhaps not the case, then what is, you know, what, what, what is the reasons for, 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 for people being off? And why have, not, why have you not been able to manage that level of, of sickness level? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but I just don't accept the premise of the question. I, 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 what I've been trying to say is that these, these figures are not exceptional figures. They are figures that go back uh, into the legacy forces. They haven't changed dramatically. Yes, we want them to improve. But we are looking at our occupational uh, therapy. We are looking at uh, improving that wherever we can do. But, but we have a very robust system to make sure that officers are supported in their off sick. They have to phone in to, to let their supervisors know that they're not coming into work. There is a follow-up. There is a return to work interview. They have access to occupational health of a good standard, although we're seeking to improve that even more. We have regular visits for our long-term sick officers and make sure we try and support them to the best of our ability. Uh, we have gyms on many of our uh, lo uh, localities where officers can try and keep themselves fit. We stress to officers the need for that. Uh, I, I think we're doing quite a lot around it. I would never say I was happy, uh, those are your words, not mine, I wouldn't say I'm happy with 4.2 percent, but what we want to do is get officers back at work as soon as possible. But I also don't want to put undue pressure on officers who are genuinely ill to feel they have to come back to work. So which is why we offer a return to work service, which means they can come back under protected duties and, and get better and recuperate and do some useful work, maybe away from the public, until they are fully fit. So I, I believe we offer quite a wide range of services uh, to, to our officers.
I'm always keen to learn about more. I think what John's getting at, can I ask it, what the percentage was with the legacy forces? You I, say I, it's I, much I, the same if you, perhaps not, I don't know if you've got it now. I haven't, I'm afraid, but I can happily write to you and give, give you those broken down figures. I think that's the point you're making, has it? Well, Even if it's just the same. Perhaps, that's perhaps one of the points, but, but the point I'm trying to get to is what have you done to improve sickness absence? For, for the past two years. I mean, what have you done? If it was 4.2 last year and 4.2 the year before, if you say it was average, what have you done this year to try and improve that? Forgive me, John. I think we've, no. I think no, we've had as it. much from the Chief Council as we've been yeah. getting that. I mean, we've had a long explanation whether or not you agree with it, but I don't think we're, and there's something fresh you're going to say. There isn't. So. Well. I'm not too sure whether I agree with your intervention there. I'm trying to get, well, to, the, I'm trying to get the basis of, <clears throat> because when you've got sickness absence, I, it can be a sickness absence, then means that somebody else has got to cover. That then comes from a... From, from I accept a that, John. It's not project. my point. I just, yeah. I mean, you can ask the question again. Okay. I'm just asking, we're going to get anything else. Uh, In addition, <coughs> you've said no. So okay. if you want to move on. Yeah, I'll move on to, to uh, another question, Sir Stephen. Uh, I know that six months into the current year, over four million pounds of cuts are still to be found, and over 1.5 million pounds of identified savings is regarded as a major challenge. Now, given that this year is still such a struggle, would you agree that this highlights extreme difficulties uh, you will face next year? I, th I think, uh, well, thank you for the question. I, th I think we've said that we're anticipating some real challenges next year uh, in, in, the 14, 15, uh, in, the, in the budget to, to balance it. Um, we've identified what we've saved last year, what we're on course to save this year, and what we expect the gap to be next year, and it's all around the mid-60s, basically. Um, so, yes, uh, we expect it to be challenging. Um, we are as we sit here getting closer to the end of this financial year, increasingly confident that we will balance the books in, in this year, uh, and that will give us a bit of a head start for uh, year three, as far as we're concerned. But it will be challenging, and, and, and I, I, I think I'm quite sure that um, Mr. Swinney would say, well, it's meant to be challenging, uh, and I'm happy to tell him it is challenging. Um, we have plans to identify where we can find some of the money, but we are still working on balancing or producing a balanced budget for uh, the coming year. Well, well, you say that you're still working on it. Are you able to tell the, uh, the committee whether uh, any of these reductions will come from uh, reducing the uh, civilian staffing? Will there be further closures, uh, registers for police stations, closure of control rooms? Uh, other savings, what are they? Well, I think it's a matter of public record, Mr Pentland, because we took it to the police authority that we, we have, a, we have a, a, a plan around the control rooms. So uh, inevitably there will be more uh, voluntary redundancies, early retirements in that area because the staff know what our plans are going forward with control rooms. I mentioned in an earlier answer that we are looking uh, to... Uh, we are reviewing our custody centres to see if we can be more efficient in the way we deal with our prisoner handling. That may result in uh, the reduction of some civilian staff. And we will continually look at all the other functions we carry out, such as finance and HR uh, and ICT, to see whether or not we can be more efficient uh, with our budget. And that might mean offering redundancies uh, to more civilian staff. So, yes, I anticipate there will be there will be more uh, reductions in civilian staff. But we're also looking in a number of other areas, we're looking to save revenue through uh, a reduction of our property uh, portfolio. We're looking to save money through investment into our property portfolio to make them more uh, efficient uh, in terms of, of, of carbon so that we can save uh, millions each year on that. We're looking at our vehicle fleet on the same, on the same grounds. We're looking at our use of ICT. We're looking at our procurement for contracts. Uh, we're still in the process of rationalising many, many hundreds of contracts that we have across the country uh, so that we can get maximum benefit from big purchase uh, because obviously we're, we're a big volume purchaser now. So there's quite a lot of different areas we're looking. We're looking at overtime um, to see whether or not we can be more efficient with our use of police overtime because it's an, it's an expensive resource. It's a necessary resource, but it's an expensive resource, and can, can we reduce that down? We're looking again at our senior officer ranks to see whether or not we can rationalise those down and try and reduce some of our more expensive senior officer ranks. 
and by senior I don't mean length of service, I mean senior in rank, um, to see whether we can manage with less of those. So the, the, there's no area that we won't consider looking at to balance the budget. Okay. Just one final question. Uh, in the meantime, uh, convener, could you uh, tell Mr Stephen how much money has been saved from the elimination of duplication since the creation of a single police force? Could, could I, could I ask that my daughter find has an answer yes, to that one? Yes, Ms Manning. Thank you. It'll, it will come on automatically. Thank you. Yes, certainly. Um, if we look at the last year, the £64 million that was saved within Police Scotland, um, looking at um, between the reform of the service and the creation of the single force, almost two-thirds of that sum came from those two areas. And in, in continuing with that in the, this financial year and next financial year, in particular with this financial year, there will be a similar sum um, with the creation of the new force. Um, that has taken out the duplication. So certainly by, by the end of this financial year, you know, almost 50% of the savings will have came from uh, the, remo the creation of the single force and the removal of duplication. Okay, that's fine. Just now, convener. It's an uh, a point. I'll take Sandra in a moment. It uh, was supplementary, but we, we've raised the issue of <coughs> excuse me, VAT chargeable to the single police force, which wasn't chargeable when we had all, all the divisions. Excuse me, I seem to have flying my throat. <coughs> How much... Are you paying out in VAT that's not recoverable? No, at the moment, we're not, uh, it's not coming out of our, of our budget. It's, it's, special it's fund. being but covered. If it weren't covered, about by 23 million. 23 million yeah. in which financial year? This one? Uh, well, it's pretty much, yeah, it would be this year and going forwards as well, be about 23 million. May I ask if you're, is it going to increase over time? I mean, you know, we're looking at 23 million at the moment. Well, you're I, getting support through a government yeah. fund, I think, but, you know, it's a big bill. So it is a, it's a huge bill. I, 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 guess, I guess logically it, will only, it would only increase if our purchasing increased as our purchasing is reducing, because that's one of the ways we're saving money. I wouldn't expect the VAT bill to increase, but it won't reduce by an awful lot. And, I mean, I'm very happy to go on record and say 23 million is a huge amount of money it's probably about 680 police officers worth, if that's of, if that's of value. My colleague calculated on yeah, the back I think, of an I, th envelope. I think the figure was 400, but I think that's quite conservative. It's, I think accurately it's about 680, <coughs> which, is, which is a lot. A lot. I'm not necessarily saying that we, if we had 23 million, we would spend it on that, but it would be good to have that money. I, I have to say I'm not a tax expert by any shape uh, or, or, or the imagination, but I do find it bewildering that we seem to be the only police service in the United Kingdom that is charged VAT. None of the 43 forces in England and Wales pay it. And the answer seems to come back from the Treasury, oh, that's because you're a central government organisation. Well, you've got the police service of Northern Ireland, they don't pay VAT. And you've got the National Crime Agency, and they don't pay VAT. But we pay VAT. I just don't understand the logic of it. And I frankly don't think the Scottish public would understand it either, really. It hasn't been explained to me in a way I can understand. Well, perhaps we'll pursue that with the Cabinet Secretary-designate um, about what the government's doing about this. I think it's a matter... It is, I take it, a matter for government rather than Police Scotland. I think the Police Authority, uh, Chair, if SPA. I may say, if, have, have a view of it, but I'm, I'm sure they would be delighted if the Scottish Government was to, was to talk to them about it and take it up, because it does seem a bit anomalous. Sandra? You supped my question, so... Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that was my supplementary in regard to the VAT, and... So Stephen has answered it exactly. You know, okay. questions that I was going to ask. So I'll, I'll keep my hand in for a question. If that's all right. I, I, absolutely. I'm sorry. I, my apologies. <laughs> I didn't lip read. It. And somebody, somebody wanted to come into the supplementary. No, it's John Finney next, followed by Alison, followed by Elaine, followed by Christian. Thank you, Convener. Uh, <laughs> it's not my handwriting. I'm accused of everything in this chair, from duplicity to trickery of all sorts. John Finney, followed by Alison. Thank you. Uh, morning. Good morning, Chief Constable. Chief Constable, you touched on it briefly in an earlier answer to, to um, Mr Pentland there. I, I, I've got some questions, and I appreciate you maybe won't have the fine detail of, but around the Climate Change Act and the obligation that's placed on public authorities. And the term used, indeed, in relation to, to the police is they are a major player in relation to the challenges we face regarding climate. Are you able to give any general outline as the extent to which spending decisions are influenced by the requirements placed, what conflict there is between savings and emissions, for instance? Um, 
I don't, I don't, I don't recognise much of a conflict, Mr. Finney, at all. There, really. I mean, uh, it, it's it's about efficiency across across the board, as far as we're concerned. So, I mean, a, a number of a number of issues. We're, we're taking uh, a sum of money in our capital spend. I'm sure Janet will know how much. But we're taking a sum of money in our capital spend to put into improvements in existing buildings usually around things like the windows, um, which tend to be old, old design, the doors, so, some stuff around the, how we generate power in some places to, to become much more efficient and use less uh, electric and gas uh, in, in relation to those. In relation to vehicle fleet, we constantly review our vehicle fleet to try to make sure that we're following all the best guidance. So, we, I mean, we are starting to use... Um, very marginally electric vehicles. We're, we're still, at, we're still at, again, the, 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 these meetings seem to be areas I'm increasingly not an expert in, but I'm not an expert in, 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 in electric vehicles, but we still have a bit of an issue with range in relation to them. Um, but we, are, we, are, we have used some uh, on the fleet, uh, and we are very happy to, uh, as they become more and more sustainable as a vehicle, we'd be very happy to take them on board as well. Uh, you'll be well aware that we've moved to a, a, a heavily diesel fleet, but as I understand it, advice and environmental advice is perhaps starting to move against uh, diesel fleets, and we will take that on board as well. I noticed that, that petrol engines have become much more efficient in the term, their terms of miles per gallon, and we may have to think about going back to that, but this is where you, know, you may get a slight conflict. That one of the things we do with our purchasing of vehicles is we're looking at the whole life cost of the vehicle so one of the important things for us is is maintenance costs diesel tends to have a lower maintenance cost uh, than, than petrol um, simply because it's got a longer maintenance schedule um, and they they can sometimes they'll go longer mileage and they'll be a bit more robust so we get more money on resale which all feed, feeds into our, our choices for vehicles but we are looking more and more at mixing vehicles and I saw recently over the weekend that hydrogen-powered vehicles are starting to make much more of an impact, admittedly in California, where it always seems to start. But they look very attractive because they don't have the range uh, limitations that, that pure electric does. So a hydrogen-powered uh, vehicle is something that, w that we would be interested in uh, trying as soon as it comes in. And, and bearing in mind, you know, Police Scotland is now the second biggest uh, police vehicle fleet in the UK so so we would get fairly fairly early access to such specialized vehicles and we'd be keen to try that out final thing I was going to mention I suppose is new builds uh, I mean I know Neil can talk far more about Dalmarnock than I can but I'm well aware that it's a very very high BRIAM rating um, it's a very high BRIAM rating yes. at, at okay. Dalmarnock um, and it was designed as that from the start if, if, you, I mean, if you want more detail I'm sure Neil can talk about that you know what that word meant what it, high. It's, it, it, it's a, what was that word, sorry? It's an industry standard for uh, low carbon usage uh, in the running of a building. It stands for something. I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's... it's, it's you the, said Briam. Briam. It's B-R-E-A-M-M, -M, I think. Uh, and it's, a, it's an industry standard. And right. you, actually, you actually see it uh, when buildings are up, up for rent, usually. It's got the... It, it tells you it's got a very high rating. We built Dalmar, or had it built, specified that it would be like that, so that the, the running costs are particularly low. I see a Christmas question in that, and some general knowledge board about BM yeah. ratings, and we're going to get it right because yeah. yeah. we're going to Google and find out what yeah. it is. In very, yes. In very basic parlance, it's the equivalent in uh, building terms to going into Curry's and buying a fridge, where you will have a look and there's A rating and A plus oh, right. rating. It's a similar kind of scale, but it uh, is representative of how efficient the building is oh, holistically. We'll talk about the BM rating of this building then. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, I'm not very technically minded, but uh, you, you, <laughs> clearly things improve, Chief Constable, as you get rid of less efficient older vehicles and similarly with buildings. Yeah. Is there any projection done about that or the time frame and how that will impact on your...? We, 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 do, we do have, and Janet's, I think... Found, found it for me, yeah. We, 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 we have set targets around uh, reducing emissions. So we're looking at a 20... Compared to where we are now, we're looking at a 25% reduction by 2020. And we're looking at 50% by... Uh, a 50% reduction by, by 2050. I mean, the aim, the aspiration, is to become a carbon-neutral organisation. 
not, not an easy thing to do. But then again, you know, you, you have to aspire uh, to these to these things. Uh, we reckon that the total cost of our carbon footprint last year was in excess of 26 million. So that, I mean, that, but that's everything. That's you know, the cost the cost of the, the cost of the of the, the fuel, the cost of the, the gas, electric, etc. Anything we can do to reduce that will be will be taxpayers' money saved and be better for the environment as well. Clearly, we're, we're scrutinising the budget. Is that something that's a regular budgetary yes. consideration? Oh yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I think I'm right in saying that all of our all of our papers to the police authority have got uh, carbon emission implications on it as well. So uh, it's something that's the, the the authority keep under scrutiny, and so so do we. Okay, thank you. That's very reassuring. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, John. Uh, Alison, followed by Lane, followed by Rod, followed by Christian. He's Thanks. smiling now, yes. Alison. <laughs> thank you. Returning to the pressures on the service, the budgetary pressures, um, not only you yourself uh, uh, this morning have acknowledged that next year is going to be challenging, but I think all of our witnesses so far have, have also exp expressed concern about that. So Callum Steele, Chief Superintendent Rennie, Derek Penman and Vic Emery have all said this coming year is going to be much harder. Um, when I pressed Derek Penman on what the risks round about that were, he said that um, the obvious risks are about the extent to which, in order to make the savings, the police might have to lose more staff. Alternatively, they might start to cut inappropriately into the other part of the budget. And that might be shown through falling service and public satisfaction levels. What, in your mind, um, Sir Stephen, are the, the, the risks ahead for the service in the next year? Well, I mean, I would not take issue with anything that, that Mr. Penman has said. I mean, he's, he's a very experienced police officer. He worked, he's worked as one, as, my, as one of my senior officers for, for about 18 months before he became uh, HMI. So he's well aware of uh, situations uh, inside the organisation. But, but I'm sure he's also, he's also well aware of the fact that when, when we look to balance the budget, we, we, we don't just say, right, well, how can we save money? We're also looking at, well, what are the operational implications of that cut, and, and there are there are operational implications, and if, if if they are if they are disproportionate, or we don't think that we can balance them in some way, then that that would not be a cut that we would have in our top line. So, we we will do exactly as councils have done, and you've seen it in the newspapers recently. They it, it, it's the it's a, a well tried strategy. They 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 list all the things that they could possibly do to balance the budget. It's published so the public can take a view on it. And when the public react violently against some things, i.e. school closures or some, something else that's, that's quite emotive, then the, the, the council get, get their sort of... That, that's them testing the water and they will, they will pull back. Well, we, 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 do something, we do something similar, which is we look at a wide range of, uh, of issues, some that, some that are politically acceptable, some that are, that are not, um, and some that are operationally uh, too damaging for us. So, for example, we, we could look at cutting back massively on our overtime budget. I mean, I think our overtime budget is about 18, 18 million, one eight million. Um, we could say, well, well, we'll save all of that money. There'll be no overtime. That that would not be a realistic uh, decision to take because overtime, whilst it's expensive, is absolutely essential in terms of flexibility and response. Um, and allowing officers to respond as they would want to do to incidents. And so that, that, that would be something that we might have on the list, but we would pretty quickly say, no, we, we, won't, we won't do that. But we might say, well, can we reduce over time by 10%? Uh, and, and how can we manage that? Could we manage that through, through better supervision of overtime to make sure that officers really did need to stay on uh, duty as long as they say they do? Or could we say, that actually, you, you can sort that out either tomorrow or you can hand that work on to somebody else and we, we have to take those steps because it's public money we're dealing with um, so it's not a case of us simply making you know the, the bottom line is not right we're going to balance this budget come what may the, the bottom line is we have to deliver a, an efficient and effective police service and we have to meet what the government wants from us and what the police authority wants from us but we have to do so within a balanced budget so it's a matter of balancing the two uh, and I know Derek would have would have put that across in, in his answer. I hope I have. And thank you for that. I mean, what we're trying to establish is, is the budget actually realistically um, appropriate for, for the kind of service that you're trying to provide? I mean, given that the projected savings were built on, let's face it, quite shaky foundations, you know, quite a sketchy outline business case, um, would you um, support a review of the timetable to meet the savings? Would you say that we need to just... Um, 
take a pause and, and have a look at the, the scale of the savings we're expected to make? Um, I think I think I'd probably have to speak up for Neil a little bit. I mean, our, our view and ACPO's view when it existed at the time was that the, that the outline business case itself was 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 solid. What what where we took issue was around the the, the savings that were attributed to it. We, ACPO never signed up for the exact amount of savings. However, uh, the first time I think I appeared in front of this uh, this this group with. Um, I'm sure that Vic Emery was with me at the time. We, we said that we accepted the budget for year one and that we thought it was, was doable. And we did the same for year two. Um, I, I feel that I have to just stick with, well, it's going to be challenging for year three, but I don't think that I, I don't feel I'm in a position uh, in any shape or form to say it's not doable. I just think it's challenging. Uh, what I would say, though, if it, if it helped you, was to say that uh, I think as members will be well aware, we have a sort of an, an overall strategic financial target of saving 1.1 billion by 2026. We are internally very confident, and I think, I think I'm right in saying Audit Scotland are confident that we will meet that strategic target of 1.1 billion pounds worth of savings by 2026. But what I've been saying to my people internally is, it's not a smooth path from here till 2026. It's quite, it's quite bumpy. And anything that could be done to smooth the path would, would, be, would be easier for us to sustain. So, so for instance, next year is, is pretty difficult. There are years beyond that, which at the moment don't seem as difficult. Having said that, they could become more difficult as we get nearer. So, you know, I'm not... I'm not an expert in, in financial projections, and, and to be honest with you, I think that's, that's a role for government and government departments to do that. Um, the budget will be challenging for next year. Uh, we, are up, we are up for the challenge, uh, but it's going to be more difficult next year than it's been in the first two years. You're up for the challenge. Are you also up um, for, for, for being open about when you think <coughs> the challenge can't be met, yes. if, if that case happens? Yeah. Uh, yes, and I, I'm happy to repeat externally what I've said internally for a number of years to, to, to my organisation, which is there will come a point where we will have to, at some point, say to politicians, we, we, we can't do any more. And if that point comes, then I, I will say that. Um, and I, I've always tried to be open and honest with, with the public in Scotland and the politicians, and that, that's the situation. Um, I don't know where we go from there, uh, when, it, when it does happen, but I see that as my role. Um, despite what people in the room may think of, think of me, my leadership style, etc., the one thing I do take very seriously is looking after my organisation so it can look after the public. And, you know, decisions that you make, you, you don't get every single decision right, but I can promise you that if the time comes where I think the organisation, the service is, is being degraded to a level then I will say so I do not see that yet I'm very proud of what we've achieved so far as I say we sit we sit here today with the crime figures released for the last year for our first full year total crime is down violent crime is down 10 percent there are some areas we'd like to improve on but I think it's a pretty good report card I think particularly when you combine it with Derek Penman's recent review of our statistics which has found that actually our recording of crime is good and we record 94% accuracy, which compares and contrasts with other parts of the United Kingdom extremely well. So the public can have confidence in our crime figures. We have confidence in them. The HMI does. The Scottish Government does. No question if I may convene. <laughs> got confidence. Oh, it's not my job to ask any questions. <laughs> the other way around. I questions so. all this way around. Yeah. <laughs> um, picking up on what you said there, which was interesting, about uh, meeting the overall target... 2026, but perhaps um, taking a different path to that. That ties in a little bit with what Vic Emery said. Uh, he said we were moving from a consolidation phase to a transformational and reforming phase. Um, and I'm concerned that that transformation um, happens alongside, with, with public confidence, and you take the public with you. And in order to do that, you need to have the time to do that. And I just wonder whether you feel um, that the budget pressures will force you to make this transformational change too quickly and that you'll lose the, the, the public on, along the way? I think we've taken some appropriate decisions so far. And I, I, you know, I keep going back to the control room one because it's a very iconic one and it's a, it's a huge structure and infrastructure for us. Um, but we've taken other 
decisions, other bold decisions on uh, our ICT development, which Neil is leading under under our, the I six umbrella. Now, I, I, I think, I mean, I do I do have to stick to the issue of. I, I genuinely believe a single service can can be delivered to the public, provide a better service than the very good service that the eight constituent forces were doing. It's not a case of fixing things they got wrong. It's building on strength. But I also believe we can do it more efficiently and more cost effectively. And, 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 and we've already heard uh, from Janet about the amount of money we saved through a reduction of the duplications. I believe there's more of that to come. Go back to the contracts issue. There's some, I think we've identified something like over 500 contracts across Scotland. Now, we already had a degree of consolidation amongst the eight forces. There were some frameworks that we bought from, but we've still got 500 contracts, which we can, we can squeeze down. Uh, ethically and appropriately, we can squeeze down the providers. So, for example, when we went live on day one, we had, we had eight different contracts with BT. They were all at different rates. Um, well, that can't be right. And so we're fixing things like that. And, and we do have a strength of dealing with some quite big outfits now because we are a big, we're a big purchaser on behalf of the Scottish public. So I think that you know, there, there are benefits. The model is a model that is capable of much, much more. And we can make more savings. So to come back to your question, do, are we going too fast? No, I, I think, I think we're, going, we're going fast. Uh, and it is causing stress and strain in the organisation. I acknowledge that, but I think we're going at the right speed because you know, we want to we want to improve as fast as we possibly can and offer as a, 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 increasingly a better service each year. And there are a number of areas where you know I can evidence that we've done that already. Can I offer a couple of comments just in support of that? <coughs> <coughs> just in terms of with the passage of time, that that issue of of pace, there are some inevitable realities that are slowing down that. Um, that our ability to move forward as rapidly as we did at the earlier stages. Um, and as the closer you get into true transformation activity, uh, the more relevant that is. So uh, to give you an example of that, Delmarnock's already been mentioned. Uh, I've been the SRO for that. It's taken us six years uh, to go from you know, the, the, the notion through to delivery. Uh, and again, the, the sort of technology uh, project that, I, again, I'm kind of leading on, that's six years, uh, and we've not yet, although we're very close to it, um, got to the point of delivery there. Uh, now, these are genuinely transformational activities that have got huge amounts of benefit, but, and there are more, I believe there's lots more within the organisation, but the Chief's point with regard to smoothing out the way, uh, I think, uh, inevitably, the delivery of these kinds of transformational changes will, by their nature, take time. You have to go through due process, you have to prove the case, you have to ensure consultation and that people are brought along with you, and all of that has, it is going to take time. So it may very well be that uh, there is uh, plenty of difficulty dividend but there are sort of cash flow oblique phasing issues that will present uh, and at the moment what we're doing is looking very closely and very rapidly at the opportunities uh, that we think are credible. I know John wants to, but I want to take everybody who's not been in first. I've got Elaine followed by Rod, then uh, Christian, then Sandra, then and then I've got Margaret wanting and she's still at the end of that, then John. Okay, So Elaine please. Yes, uh, so Stephen, last year you told us that there was no policy for backfilling of vacant civilian post posts by police officers. However, Tina Yule of HMIC, when talking of the custody report, uh, stated that um, part of the resourcing model is to backfill from local police of policing with police officers, although she did go on to say it wasn't necessarily for civilian staff, it could be for other policing staff. Uh, also, Stevie Diamond uh, said that, um, who, yeah, that where there were vacancies, uh, police officers who would be put in. That was their experience. Uh, and Chief Superintendent Rennie also said the job still has to be done. However, logic dictates that more police officers will perform these functions. Uh, there may be no policy about backfilling, but it sounds like backfilling is actually happening. So what are you doing to monitor and address the situation where police officers appear to be carrying out work which would be more appropriately carried out by civilian support staff? Um, I think I've said at this meeting before that um, you've, you've quoted me quite accurately. There is no policy or strategy on backfilling. But I think I also said that, that, that of course, backfilling goes on on a daily basis because people go sick. Uh, they have to be filled at short notice. 
Um, that, that, that's inevitable, an organisation of 23,000 people across, across the country. There is no policy to do it. Uh, I think uh, you're referring to the, to the comment that, that uh, Ms Yule made in relation to the inspection uh, in Fife. I think, therefore, it's also fair to say that Derek Penman said in his report that they didn't find evidence of backfilling as a strategy. Um, so that's the other side of the, the, other side of the coin. Um, there is inevitably backfilling across custody all across the country. But as you pointed, actually, I think you said in your question, that's more around police officers backfilling other police officers' roles. It's not backfilling uh, civilian custodians. Uh, the reason for that is simply that, um, and this is one reason why we're reviewing custody as a whole, that our custody uh, provisions are very, very uneven. Uh, requirements are very uneven. So. Uh, they, they start ramping up in terms of prisoners being taken into custody on a Thursday, keep going up in terms of volume, hit a peak on uh, Sunday night because we don't have Saturday or Sunday courts, therefore the, the cells are filling up. And then on Monday morning there's this mass exodus to the courts. So if, if you go in there on a Monday afternoon, you need a, a, a fraction of the staff that you need on a Saturday and a Sunday night. So to employ people... Um, at an even level would be vastly expensive, far more expensive than we need. So we, so we provide uh, a surge capacity from police officers. So it's not so much backfilling as reinforcement of the existing staff who are in there on a, on a, on a permanent rotor. Um, we also have examples where, for example, in Aberdeen, in our contact centre in Aberdeen, we have police officers... Uh, doing jobs that were previously done by uh, staff colleagues. The reason for that is simple, uh, that, that it's, uh, it's well publicised that we will be closing down uh, the control room contact centre in Aberdeen. Staff are taking advantage of the very buoyant uh, uh, labour market in the area and are, are going to other jobs early on. We, we've therefore agreed with the unions it would be pointless us to bring in more civilian staff to backfill for a short period of time. It would be unfair. Uh, to do it with agency staff, I think, would be risking some danger because you need p experienced people. So we deploy police officers in that instance because we know that it's only a matter of time before the control room shuts down. So we do backfilling in certain cases where we think it's a logical thing to do, and we try to get union acceptance uh, of that. But there is still, at this moment in time, no policy around backfilling. Say that Ms. Yule did say it was backfill for any custody of officer, whether civilian or police. She, wouldn't, she didn't say it was just for police officers. She said it was for civilian officers as well. Uh, and Stevie Diamond particularly was talking about where there were <coughs> unfilled vacancies rather than where they were, uh, if you like, the, the closures were, were imminent. But uh, my question actually was, are you monitoring where backfilling is happening? Yes. And, uh, and would you take steps to address it if it is inappropriate? Yes, I'm sorry, I should have been more direct. Yes, we do, we do monitor it, and where we think it's inappropriate, we will take steps. But as I say, uh, I wouldn't expect in the organisation for it to happen because there's no strategy or policy to support it. So people would be acting outside of strategy if they did it. Can I go on to uh, other evidence we had the same day from uh, Superintendent Rennie and from St uh, Steve Diamond as well about stress on staff members, police officers at superintendent level, for example who he said uh, were working long hours, uh, were not able to take their rest days or their annual leave, and often when they felt sick would rather use annual leave than report in sick. Uh, and C.B. Diamond also told us that he was surprised that sickness absence rates had not increased more for civilian staff because of the stresses that they were under. What's your view of that? Are you concerned about that? Are you taking steps to address some of these issues? I'm always concerned if I hear that staff are under un undue stress. Um, but we've, we have reviewed regularly the superintending ranks and the roles that they carry out. So one of the, one of the things that we've looked at is the on-call rota for superintendents. And we've, we've added the number of superintendents into that on-call rota. So I think the average figure is around about superintendents are on-call one, one week in nine. Uh, which I, I don't think is particularly onerous. We've done a, a fair degree of engineering to make sure that nobody is, uh, is overburdened in that. There is a higher proportion of on-call amongst uh, specialist crime directorate superintendents because they're smaller, in, they're smaller in number. But as for divisional superintendents across, across the territorial divisions, I, I, don't, I don't think that the on-call 
uh, burden on them is particularly onerous. I meet with, I met with two divisional commanders uh, in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire yesterday at a long service medal ceremony. Um, I, I can tell you that their morale seemed particularly, particularly high. I meet superintendents on a virtual daily basis, and yes, they work hard. Uh, but the Superintendents Association has done a good job in making sure their remuneration is not a bad remuneration. Um, and frankly, they're senior managers in the organisation, and I expect them to work hard. I don't want them to be unduly stressed, um, but they've got difficult jobs to do, making difficult decisions, sometimes uh, without over-dramatising it, life and death decisions in relation to firearms incidents or any other incidents. They manage a great range of incidents, um, you know, search and rescue on, 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 on in the highlands, etc. And we put a great deal of uh, faith into our superintending ranks. I I'm sure they find their jobs tough. I I'd be disappointed if they felt that they couldn't take their annual leave. It's not something that I've noticed as an issue, if I'm honest. Um, I certainly see them uh, taking annual leave. So I don't think they're not, I don't think the situation, they're not leaving work at all. Um, we meet regularly with the Superintendents Association, and I do mean regularly, uh, and they raise a number of issues uh, with me. And, and I'll be honest, yes, they've raised concerns about the on-call rotor in the past. They've raised concerns about uh, allowances for cars. Uh, and we talk on these matters on a regular, on a regular basis. And I think it's a perfectly appropriate uh, way of dealing with the problem. The impression that we got from, from that evidence was that some of the savings that had been made by, if, uh, if you like decluttering or whatever you might call it, or the, the efficiency savings at that sort of rank, uh, instead of going into the police service, have actually gone into the SBA and the PIRC rather than actually into front line policing. Do you, would you agree with that concern? Um, I, it's not something I, I don't see that as a pattern. I mean, we, we have reduced the number of superintending ranks um, quite, quite markedly in the organisation. There's a bit more to go. Um, we have uh, uh, probably about 20 more superintendents uh, in, in existence at the moment in the organisation than we have posts that we need them to do. So we still have some extra superintendents and we will reduce down to that through when people, people retire. Um, we've converted um, superintending ranks posts in the main into police constable posts. And yes, I guess there's some saving between the, the, the cost of a police constable and the, police, and the cost of a, of a superintendent or chief superintendent. But, you know, we've generated £20 million worth of savings from police salaries uh, to contribute towards the, the, the budget targets. And some of that has come from a reduction in senior ranks. I mean, I would remind you that we've more than halved the bill for chief officer ranks across Scotland as well. Thank you. Thank you. Rod, followed by Christian, please. Um, good morning, uh, Christine. Um, could I just start by uh, referring to a question I put to Vic Emery? Um, about the funding of uh, uh, police officers formerly funded by local authorities and what the up-to-date position is in relation to that. He suggested that I address that to you. Can... How kind. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I, I certainly can. I, I do have, yeah, I've got some information on that somewhere. Um, we have about, I think it's about um, 329 officers who are um, currently funded by uh, various various councils across across the across the country, um, the, the two the two biggest chunks of those are, as, I, I guess, as one would expect, in Edinburgh and in Glasgow, uh, which contribute um, probably two two thirds of that of that number. Uh, the rest are from a number of other councils who provide uh, essential but smaller smaller numbers of funding. Uh, I think we're seeing uh, some. Uh, some pressure, as one would expect from councils on that, and, and a couple of the smaller uh, contributing councils have said that they might find that more difficult next year. I have to say, in my experience, we get that every year, but, but often the money, the money is forthcoming because they do value uh, the, the extra policing that they get. But obviously that's entirely a matter for the councils. We'd be disappointed if it happens, but, but we understand that everybody has budgets to balance. Is still largely in, in, intact. Is, yeah, it's very, okay. it's very much still, still there at the moment. Yes. Okay. Could I move on to uh, a separate issue? Property. Um, last year, I think you said there were about 800 buildings, only about half of which were operational. Um, in terms of trying to to, to maximise resources, a year later, 
kind of, could you summarise the position in relation to property? Yeah, I, I'm, I just for, forgive me, uh, just to, to sort of pin down that. If if I said it's eight hundred, it is eight hundred buildings. If I said that that half are operational, what what I would have meant by operational is we we have operational officers working from them, not that they're empty. Um, so uh, 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 was was that? What, what you meant, because they're not, they've, ne they've never been empty as such. It's that they are administrative centres or, ev yeah. or even old headquarters buildings. I mean, I, I wouldn't classify, for example, uh, the Pitt Street building, which um, it, we, we still run. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that was operational. It has a control room in it, but operational units don't work from Pitt Street. It's an administrative centre, and there's quite a few of those around the country. I think, in general, we are... We are looking, at, well, we are, we are in the midst of developing with the police authority and a number of other um, agencies a, a very comprehensive property strategy, and we are looking to reduce our property, but w with the huge emphasis on the non-operational buildings, which is probably where I use the phrase, I guess. Fair, you described it as only half of those are what the public would recognise as operational buildings. Right, so, right. Okay. So, uh, yeah. so, so we're still idea. focusing on reducing yeah. down. The, the, the number one target we had was to get out of any expensive leases that we had. Uh, and and we've, done a, we've done a lot of work on that and we're out of m most of our expensive leases. Then we were looking to say, look, can we, can we uh, rationalise, uh, can we put more people into buildings, can we sell off some buildings? Um, we get some capital return on that, but actually we also get a revenue uh, uh, uplift on that as well. We, we save money doing it that way. We're still in the, midst of, in the midst of doing that, and if you combine that with the point I made to Mr Finney about um, we are making sure that when we put new buildings up, they're more efficient uh, in terms of uh, our utilities, then that's, that, that's where we're headed. Uh, for 14, 15... Uh, we are expecting to get about £5 million in receipts from buildings that we have sold in this financial year. And that ranges all the way from police houses that we no longer need up to much larger, much larger buildings. And just in relation to overtime, last year you said that uh, you'd shaved about £10 million from the previous year and you talked about an overtime budget of £22 million. This morning you were talking about £18 million. Um, in the light of kind of pressures, for example, investigating domestic abuse, um, for example, is that overtime budget sufficient? Uh, and it, I think Mr. Pemmon also indicated that to some degree that was devolved to divisional commander. So a bit more flesh on the overtime I think would be helpful. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, Jan Janet reminds me in a hastily written note that some, some of the savings uh, around overtime has been that we have... And I have to give credit to the, to the Federation and Callum Steele in particular here. Uh, he came forward with a proposal to us, which was to convert a number of public holidays um, into um, annual leave days, which doesn't sound like anything particularly dramatic, but it, but it means that what, what, what we were able to do was avoid paying public holiday rates to police officers uh, and simply say, right, instead of X number of public holidays, we'll give you X plus of annual leave instead. The benefit for the police officers was actually it's far more flexible. Um, you, you can only take a public holiday off on the day it's a public holiday, but if you, if, if you work that as an ordinary day, but you get, a, you get an annual leave day uh, in return, you can actually nominate to take that at a time of your own choosing within reason. Um, so that saved us probably about what, four million. That, that saved us from our overtime bill. So there's been savings there without cutting actual uh, cops on the street. Um, but I do go back to, we need to be as efficient as we possibly can. Overtime is expensive, uh, and we have to make sure that the supervisors are authorising it, that uh, there's a third eye on this to say, yes, we, can, we need that spending. That person has to be interviewed now by that officer. We can't have some other officer interview them because they've got a rapport going, um, and it has to be done before the end of the shift, or uh, it has to be done today. Um, so long as we're happy with that, we'll, we'll, pay the, we'll pay the overtime. A big element of overtime comes from unexpected incidents, usually tragic ones, uh, homicide investigations, etc., where we simply have to get feet on the street early for public reassurance, and a, a lot of homicides are solved very, very early on, uh, with door-to-door, etc. We have to put people out to do that. So we still spend where we need to spend. It is devolved. Uh, Rose Fitzpatrick, the... the, the 
the deputy for local policing uh, keeps some at the centre, but she also devolves to divisional, to divisional commanders uh, a proportion of the overtime budget for them to spend. It's not something that we control from the centre, it's controlled uh, local units. What extent to kind of policing major events and trying to recover the costs of policing major events factor into that? Uh, I think I'm sure members are aware, I'm sure that, that, that Vic mentioned it was when he was here, that the authority has, has uh, we've worked on it together, but we've brought in a policy around consistency of charging uh, at, uh, at events, uh, which means that we are able across the country to be uh, a lot more um, consistent around how we do it. I mean, I've, I have got some figures, but I'm going to have to try and, I'm going to have to try and find them. I'm struggling at the moment. Apologies. Um, yeah, thanks. So if you want to pass it to somebody well, else. Well, no, it's just... Uh, <laughs> Not saying so you can't cope, I, but... I think, I, think, I, think the figures, uh, I think the figures are, are quite interesting. Since, since the 1st of April 2013 till today, we've had uh, recorded in our, in our sort of log of, uh, of events, 12,195 events. Uh, and we have recovered full costs at 272 um, and further 81, there's been recovery of some costs. So now that doesn't include football matches. So that's just every other event. And it ranges from you know, a, lo a local gala or fete up to, dare I say, Hogman A in Edinburgh. Um, and we look at a number of issues. But the authority's policy is very clear on this, which is where it's a profit-making enterprise, it's full cost recovery. Now, I have to be very clear on this. We would rather not have any officers at it at all. But if it's an event that requires a level of policing, that's for the local commander to decide what the level of policing is. Once that has been decided, and it's done on public safety, crime prevention grounds, then that's the number of police officers. That's what we will tell the organisers and the people who will make a profit out of this. And then there's a full cost recovery. Some are abated, and they're abated for a number of different reasons, uh, where, for example... It's, it's got some element of um, public uh, interest in it and an abatement will be applied to that. Um, some are full cost recovery. And that's in line with the police authorities' policy on this. And we take the bigger decisions on this to the Finance and Investment Committee of the Police Authority for them to agree the level of abatement or whether it should be a full cost recovery uh, event. Thank you. And presumably there's a contract between yourself Police Scotland or the SP and the, the event organisers, yes. whatever there's a, a stitched, I was going to say a stitched up contract, that sounds, sounds wicked. Mm. But you know what I mean? A, 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 a firm contract yes. so everybody knows where they are yeah. at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, I mean, we, we would be more inclined to call it a memorandum of understanding that we will provide these Which, officers under the command of this, of this rank to do the following jobs. But we would also expect them to provide, for example, a number of stewards, because yes. that would reduce the costs. We're not out to, you know, we were not out to put loads of cops at these events. We, we would like that reduced as much as possible. Football's a good example. We now run a, quite a number of non-policed football matches across Scotland where there is no police presence because history and intelligence says there's no trouble at these matches, so we don't need police officers. There are others, unfortunately, where we need to deploy quite a few officers. And is there a mem memorandum of understanding, as I say, a contract? Yes. With the, thank you. Just, just to clarify that, that it's not just uh, sprung upon people. They know exactly what they're going to have to pay for um, at the end of the day uh, if you're sending police officers. Uh, Christian followed by Sandra. Good morning. And that was my, the main thrust of my question. But uh, if I want to go back into uh, the football clubs and particularly the numbers you just give us... Uh, how much money are we talking about uh, for, for, since April 2013 to today? And how much has still to be recovered? And how much which is due not to be recovered at all? Um, so, well, I mean, I, I, can, I can give a general introduction to it. Obviously, as I say, we do a number of matches now that are police-free, so there's no, there's, no, there's no charge for those. Uh, where, where we are providing police officers to a football club, we would expect full cost recovery because they're a profit-making mm -hmm. enterprise. So I mean, we have to distinguish you know, amateur, amateur clubs where they might be in a cup final or something that, that actually does happen. I'm thinking of one in particular in Ayrshire where it's, they're not, they're not profit-making clubs, but we still have to put a police presence because tensions run quite high. But 
where they're a profit-making enterprise, we'll provide police officers where we think intelligence and history provides we should do. We'll agree it with the club, but that would be expected to be a, a full-cost full cost recovery uh, situation. I, I don't have specific figures for that. I do know how much... Well, Janet knows how much money is owed to us by football clubs, I think. Yes, um, certainly. In, in terms of, um, as the Chief Constable outlined, we do have uh, a number of officers which, when they do attend football clubs, and we have a, a one since issuing the invoice, we have a recovery process like any other organisation would do. Um, so really, when we take to, at the moment, anything which is over 90 days, um, it's a very, very small amount, actually. It's only um, £85,000. When you look at, at the moment, um, you're... I haven't had the exact figure with me, but um, recoveries from football clubs in general and total are much higher than that. We have a very good active pro uh, programme of following up and recovering uh, where we've issued an invoice. And um, we do that in line with uh, working with the clubs and working with the commanders to ensure that any monies do come back to us. It's a good point of public perception because, of course, in the North East, in Aberdeen, for example, there has been some football club, some football matches that were not policed at all. So if the future could be there, that would be great savings at the end of the day. The last some of the, uh, uh, you touched upon it, and I think uh, we, we heard from evidence that the last some of the private uh, identities which you, uh, you, you provide as well. Do we have any, any numbers for those? What kind of money are we talking about, money which has not been recovered? And uh, uh, what, what's, what's your, your policy? Are you changing your policy on, on how to recover the, the, this, this money? Or is it the same policy that you had in the past? In, in terms um, of uh, legacy practices, a number of the various legacy forces had, did have different practices. And yes, we are looking to amalgamate those and um, look for the best recovery process possible. But in the main, then, whilst they, they did have differences, they tended to follow a, a similar route of either um, following up by letter or actually um, in verbal contact with them or arranging meetings with each and every individual and, if necessary, taking appropriate legal action. So, uh, have you got any legal action on this now? Not at this point in time. Not at this point. And have you got a national... Uh, we heard uh, from uh, uh, Derek Bateman that you had a national policy of recharging. Is that in place? Yes, we have an approved policy. Um, it worked in, we actually worked along with the SPA in bringing out the full cost recovery policy, and um, that has been in place since August of 2013. Thank you very much for this. And another question, if I may. We had from Vic Henry, he told us about a meeting of academics, the Scottish Government and yourself, uh, to see what uh, policing will look like in 5, 10 and 15 years' time. And you, we, we approach about what the expectation of the public and of politicians are, are for the service. Uh, how are we on, on this discussion? And have we progressed? And have we got a timetable already? We, we are progressing on it, yes, uh, but I think it's something we don't, we, don't want to, we don't want to rush too much. I think the issue here is it's, it's fine asking the, the police service what it thinks it should look like in 5, 10, 25 years' time. Um, I'm sure the police authority has a, has a valid view as well, but I think, I think it's, it's as important to ask a variety of other stakeholders and particularly, particularly the public in terms of what, what would they like to see in terms of positive change. So I, I anticipate this will take some while, but there have been several meetings already between groups within Police Scotland and the Police Authority to start discussing uh, some of the concepts that we'll be looking at going forward over the next five and 10 and 20 years. Um, we also want to make sure that we, we pay attention to what's going on internationally because there's a lot of thinking going on about this sort of thing, a lot of ICT developments uh, going on around the world that we need to make sure we take we take advantage of. So I, the work is ongoing. I wouldn't promise that it's going to be finished in, in, in three or six months' time. I think, I think we need to take our, take our time with it. And we want to make sure that we, we talk sufficiently to public, to local councils, uh, to a variety of stakeholders, crowd, the Crown, for example, as to what it is. So, for example, we, we had a meeting of the Justice Board recently uh, that Lord Carloway came along to, uh, and he was talking about the, the Scottish Government's digital... Uh, strategy and the digitalisation in, in relation to courts and the, and, the, and the legal processes, which you know takes us in, takes us into areas like body worn uh, video cameras, which you'll be aware of from the, from from the north. It's certainly been in place in Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire for a few years now, 
uh, and is something I know the police authority is keen to talk to stakeholders, including the public, about moving forward with, because it's, a, a, I think, a fairly sensible and practical approach to evidence gathering and transparency uh, in the criminal justice system. Are you considering in the future maybe a sharing of budget with other services like social care or the NHS, so sharing buildings, sharing control rooms maybe? Well, we, all, we already uh, have, have a, uh, a, I guess, more than a toe, a foot in the water around sharing buildings. So, for example, the Fort, the Fort William uh, police office that was, that was uh, funded, uh, to give them credit, by the Northern Constabulary Police Board um, is a shared facility with um, Scottish Ambulance Service. Uh, we're in discussion with uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue around whether or not they want to use parts of our West Bell Street facility in Dundee. Uh, and and that, that would potentially be a control room facility. So it wouldn't be a fully integrated control room yet, but it would be a step, it would be a step towards that. And I, I'm sure Vic has said, and, and, and I share his aspiration, that the next generation of control rooms, not, not probably... In, in three or five years, but 10, 15 years out, I would expect, I'd be surprised if they're not shared across the emergency services. Thank you. Uh, I'm conscious of time, so I've got two members who want to ask, so I'm going to ask you to give your questions, Margaret and John, and then we'll get uh, we'll join the questions together. So, Margaret, what's yes, your question? Yes, very briefly, Chief Constable. Um, in previous sessions, I, I'd asked about budgets for campaigns, such as the 101 uh, numbers, doorstep sellers, keeping safe online, and just general PR budgets, but it wasn't clear um, eh, how much is spent on this or, or where you would find a breakdown of this information. Uh, it's quite important in terms of preventative spend to see how effective it is. Thank you. John? Uh, I've kind of three questions. Uh, yeah. Convener. The uh, first one is... is yeah, I'm really, uh, really, really quite important, you know, for my benefit. Uh, <coughs> Sir Stephen, uh, in an earlier uh, response to Alison McInnes, you mentioned that you were quite confident that the £1.1 billion would be achievable come 2120, and Whilst I find it's perhaps the case that that will be... How, how do you then measure that up with what Vic Emery said last week, that uh, you're unaware of what prison will cost and you're unaware of what the future holds for, for, for prison? So are you, are you perhaps then telling us that the future of, of Police Scotland will depend on the budget you have available? Uh, my second question is along the lines of... You mentioned earlier that you spend £18 million on overtime. And perhaps if you don't have the answer just now, you may be able to write to the committee how much of that is actually spent on uh, covering for absence sickness. And my third question is one that it was yourself, convener, who asked me to ask Police Scotland with regards to Victim Support Scotland. Uh, Victim Su Support Scotland uh, they are dependent on funding uh, to cover areas of domestic violence, sexual crimes and human trafficking. And... Uh, Will that funding still be available this year for them? I don't know where that one came from. I don't remember. But anyway, just what, what you can, uh, Chief Constable. Thank, uh, thank you, Chair. In, ter in, terms of, in terms of Ms Mitchell's uh, question, um, I, I've, actually got a, I've actually got a breakdown here of what we've spent on different campaigns. I'm, I'm happy to, to write, because it's sort of two pages worth, I'm happy to write to you and include that as an appendix. Yeah. Um, I, th I would say, though, we are, spending, we are spending a significant proportion and a greater proportion um, on the social media side and electronic media. Not, not so much television adverts, but uh, YouTube uh, and the, 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 the internet and a lot on Twitter. I mean, I'm, I'm sure a number of you will be aware we've got something about 178 uh, Twitter feeds across, across Police Scotland, and they are extremely active. I think we've got something like... 600,000 uh, contacts now around uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, etc. So we, we're using that a lot more. And that often is more considered to be more cost effective than more traditional TV and newspaper uh, coverage. Does it come under in the budget, you know, the bid? Uh, I don't know. I've got it broken down here by actual campaign. So it's quite detailed what I've got yeah. and, and the cost of each of the campaigns, which. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I can Good leave it with that. you if you want. So. Sorry, I can leave still. this with you if you want. <laughs> yes, well, okay, so that would be even better. Yeah. Have it in, we get uh, a copy to members. Uh, I'm just conscious that we've got I, yeah, yeah. John's um, questions now. John the one point. One, how, how can I be confident? Well, I can be confident because we, we've we've reduced savings already by such an amount that is recurring each year 
that we know that that will add up to a saving of 1.1 billion by 2026. It's a, it's a simple multiplication uh, exercise. Um, do, I, do I know what my budget will be in 2026? N no, I, I have no idea what my budget will be in 2026. I, I hope it's sufficient to, to run uh, a first-class police service. But, but in terms of the amount of money that we are not spending each year going forward, that will add up to 1.1 billion by 2026, which is what we were asked uh, to do. Uh, I can't give you uh, an indication of how much of the £18 million pounds, uh, on, that we spend on overtime is spent covering sickness absence, but the reality is overtime is, is, is usually spent, as, as I've already said actually in the meeting, to cover un, unforeseen events, homicides, um, other, other emergencies that take place, uh, searches for missing persons uh, in, in open country, um, uh, public order situations, a variety, that's where the overtime gets spent. It doesn't, it doesn't get spent so much on covering absence of sickness because I mean take, take, the, take the obvious point if, if at seven o'clock in the morning at the start of a shift someone calls in sick then we're down, we're down one then I would expect the sergeant or the inspector to make sure that that person if we need to cover it that that person's vacancy is covered in some other way there wouldn't be the ability that there's no one to, to really to, 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 to pay the overtime to it's not really something that is done um, I'm going to. I know. No, John. I'm sorry. No, uh, John. We've had answers. And you've not. And the and, and chief counsel has said, as, as no, as, "Please as, don't as interrupt as, me." No, please don't interrupt me. We've had an answer which says you can't give us the actual detail. You've put on the record that it's, as I understand, to paraphrase you, it's highly unlikely that you're using overtime to cover for sickness. You've given incidents that the chief counsel has put that on the record. If there's anything additional that could be added by any breakdown that which you may or may not have, if it's about overtime covering sickness, then you provide it to us, I take it. Happy so to. would that satisfy you? Well, the, the reason I'm asking the question because, you know, the, the, the level of sickness absence within the, the police force is 4.2%. What I really need to find out, <laughs> how much of that overtime bill of £18 million pound has been spent to cover that? That's the only question I'm asking. It's on the record, and I've okay. dealt with it, and I've said because we don't have the details just now, it can provide it if at that level you have it. I can't, I can't do better than that, and the Chief Constable, and neither can his panel, answer it on the spot. Thank you very much for your evidence. We will now take a break for five minutes before the next panel comes in.
Um, can I, we're back again, and can I welcome to the meeting Michael Matheson. Here we go, as a mouthful, Cabinet Secretary for Justice Designate. And can I congratulate you, uh, Michael, on your appointment? This brings you back full cycle, I think, to the era when we first came into Parliament. It does, the old Justice and Home Affairs Committee. Indeed, indeed. I can't remember if I was a convener then or not, but I don't seem to have moved on anywhere. <laughs> I, I call, don't know uh, why. Well, it was, it was Rosanna was the convener of the... Justice and Home Affairs Committee, and you became the convener of the Justice One Committee. Uh, that's what happened. Our history is exposed, but as I say, you've had a trajectory very different from my own. <laughs> uh, however, if you don't rise, you don't fall. Uh, my, <laughs> I've settled for that. Can I also welcome uh, Neil Rennick, Acting Director of Justice, Gillian Russell, Deputy Director of Police Division, Hilary Pierce, Police Division, and Richard Dennis, Deputy Director of Fire and Rescue Division. And can I invite your Cabinet Secretary Designate to make an opening statement? Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee today. Uh, people across Scotland rely on our justice system to live in safety and security, to ensure that their rights are protected, and to resolve disputes fairly and swiftly. The draft budget for 2015-16 is focused on maintaining access to and the quality of vital justice services within the context of continuing restraint on our overall budgets. Over recent years, we have managed to achieve this by reforming and transforming how justice services are structured and delivered. By doing so, we have protected vital frontline services made more efficient use of resources and strengthened delivery at both national and local levels. For police, the single service has strengthened local policing while ensuring all parts of Scotland have access to specialist expertise and equipment wherever and whenever it is required. Officer numbers are high. The latest figures show there are 17,267 officers in Scotland, an increase of 1,033 from 2007. Public confidence in our police is also high and is rising. It's been another remarkable year for policing in Scotland. Policing at the Glasgow Commonwealth Games was exemplary and played a crucial role in it being the most successful Games ever, safely enjoyed by tens of thousands of spectators from across the globe. The Raider Cup, too, was another example of first-class policing of one of the world's greatest sporting spectacles. There were many successes, all taking place against the backdrop of the shocking and tra tragic events at the Clutha Bar almost exactly a year ago. With characteristic commitment, police and other emergency services uh, responded with professionalism, even when they knew three of their own were lost in the wreckage. A typical response from our police in the most testing of circumstances. And the fear of crime is also reducing. Convener, figures published earlier this morning confirm crime has fallen again and is now at a 40-year low. Non-sexual crimes uh, of violence have fallen by 10% as a result of proactive policing and an increase in historic reporting and willingness of more victims to come forward. Sexual crimes have increased by 12%. Crimes of handling an offensive weapon have dropped by 5%, a fall of 62% since 2006-07. And the clear-up rate for all crime has increased and is now at the highest level since 1976, the first year for which comparable figures are available. Our police make an immense contribution to that success, and we value that contribution, and we will not attack their terms and conditions of our officers. Compared to England and Wales, uh, with the hated Windsor package, which were, uh, was imposed on officers, their police numbers are falling and predicted to decrease by some 15,400. Police Scotland and the SPA are making excellent progress in delivering savings. The vast majority of the savings are sustainable and recurring, and that's why great progress has already been made towards delivering the projected £1.1 billion by 2026. I also want to commend the similarly uh, strong progress which has been made by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, police and fire reform are part of the wider reforms of our justice system. The Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act uh, 2014 places the interests of victims at the heart of the reform agenda. When implemented in full, it will strengthen the rights of victims to support and standards of services 
and require offenders to contribute towards the cost of providing immediate support to victims. The Court Reform Scotland Act 2014, which received royal assent earlier this month, will also result in significant modernisation of Scotland's courts and civil justice system in at least a generation. Uh, and from April next year, the Courts and Tribunal Service will merge into the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service under the leadership of the Lord President and Eric McQueen, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Court Service. The Scottish Court Service has also confirmed uh, that major investment in new state-of-the-art ICT to transform how people access our court services. Uh, this form part, forms part of our ambitious justice digital strategy, which was launched over the summer. The Court Service has confirmed that it has the necessary physical capacity to accommodate the current and anticipated volume of criminal and civil cases within the court estate. Despite budgetary cuts, the Scottish Court Service and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service have increased their legal staff numbers since 2008, with the Fiscal Service seeing an increase of some 70 additional legal staff. Uh, convener, an effective and efficient justice system is vital to meet the challenges of uh, a modern, fair and equal Scotland. We will continue to encourage and support our law enforcement agencies to tackle crime robustly, including sexual offences, domestic abuse and serious and organised crime. We will also continue to support preventative measures which can encourage people away from crime or help people to resolve civil disputes more quickly. I and my officials are, of course, more than happy to take questions from the committee. Well, I've, I've been a bit indulgent because it's your, your first, your maiden voyage, uh, Cabinet Secretary-designate, but we will now move on to, I'm afraid, the meat of the day, which is the questions relating to policing, courts and the Crown Service and access to justice at large. And I've got, oh, well, I've got Roderick, Christian, Sandra, Elaine, Margaret, John Finney, Alison, that's it so far. Right, um, Roderick. Um, morning. If you don't mind, I'll just call you Mr. Matheson rather than the longer title. <coughs> um, <laughs> could I just begin with something that's uh, been in uh, several of our evidence sessions in which I wrote to your predecessor about, which is a question of recoverability of fat in relation to Police Scotland in particular. Um, I raise the issue really in terms of how negotiations were going with HM Treasury on this matter. I don't know if there's anything you can add. I don't want to be too difficult on your first outing, but is there anything you can add to that debate? Well, you'll be aware that my predecessor had pursued this issue on several occasions over several years now uh, with um, Her, Her Majesty's Treasury, uh, with a variety of different ministers responsible for this policy area. Uh, to date, um, the... Uh, Treasury ministers have refused to change their policy position on this matter, uh, which we think is unacceptable. Um, we are in a situation where uh, this is costing uh, the Scottish uh, Police Service some £24 <coughs> million pounds per year. Uh, and if we were in a position where we could secure the exemption in the same way uh, that other forces in the UK have been able to do so, that's money that clearly could be invested into. Um, or, uh, Secretary designate, which I will call you, uh, it, it equates to, we were told, 680 police officers. Well, I think that just exemplifies yeah. the, the impact that this can have. Yeah. Um, we are very clear uh, that this is a, a policy matter which could be changed very readily by... I'm getting negotiations from the left from Sandra. <laughs> just, you're, you're next on my list. Sorry, Cabinet Secretary-designate. Off you go. Um, we're, we're very clear this is a policy matter uh, which uh, 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 Treasury Ministers uh, would be free to make a decision on uh, and could do so, in my view, at the stroke of a pen if they chose to uh, do so. Um, I certainly intend to pursue this issue with vigour um, and uh, any of the suggestions that the committee may have around how they may be able to assist uh, in pursuing this matter with the, uh, with the UK government uh, would certainly be welcome. But I've, uh, I'm uh, very clear that the present situation is completely unacceptable uh, and uh, I'll certainly be pursuing the matter further with the UK Treasury uh, to try and get a change of policy in this area. I'm grateful for that assurance. Could I just move on to the... the on, yeah. Is the correspondence with the Treasury in the public domain? Um, 
It is in the public domain, yes. So, so we okay. could see right. that's all I want to say. Thank you, Convener. Could I just move on to, uh, more generally to the question of uh, um, number of cases coming to trial in courts? I don't want to be too bogged down in figure work, but there certainly seem to be an increase in the number of cases in both uh, the Sheriff Court and the High Court, and in particular an increase in the number of trials which uh, has necessitated extra funding being called for from the Justice Board this year. Uh, um, Mr. McQueen, in evidence last week, just said there have been positive signs of a reduction in business volumes. However, if, uh, if they got it wrong and in the middle of next year they found that there, there was still the, the, this uh, pressure of cases, they would uh, discuss that with the Justice Board and government. How far uh, can you kind of cover the eventuality that more money will be required uh, to cover the, this activity? Well, you will appreciate that it, um, our court service is a demand-led service, um, that it's difficult to predict uh, what the full demand will be in the, in the year ahead. You can work on the basis of historical experience um, uh, and plan your resources based upon that. But there will, of course, be issues where there will be um, a, an increase in demand that you may not have anticipated. So, for example, uh, there's been an increasing number of uh, sexual offences cases being taken to trial, um, uh, uh, road traffic offences, domestic violence matters which are uh, being taken to trial. That's clearly created a level of pressure uh, on the uh, Scottish Court Service uh, and the way in which they uh, carry out their responsibilities. And that's why my predecessor uh, made arrangements for uh, some additional resource to be made available. Um, in this financial year, some £1.47 million uh, to assist the, uh, at the court service and also our prosecutors uh, to have the additional resource that they require uh, in, order to, uh, uh, in order to meet that increasing uh, demand. And I think it's... Uh, underscores the important value of the Justice Board in being able to have the different elements of the justice system in dialogue, um, exploring issues uh, that may emerge in the course of the year. And, of course, we are part of that to be able to then respond to uh, any changes that may be necessary in years. So um, it, it's a demand-led service. Uh, you can plan as best as you, 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 you are able to, based upon uh, historical experience. Uh, but uh, we do recognise that there will at times be uh, in-year pressures and we've responded this year to the increasing demand because of more cases going to court as a result. And if next year kind of the same demand is there, we will be able to respond? Is we'll certainly work with the Justice yeah. Board and see how we can achieve that. Yeah. So there's certainly a desire on our part to make sure uh, that, we, uh, that we respond to demand uh, when it occurs and to try and provide them with the support and assistance that they require to meet that increasing demand. OK, I'll let other members in. Okay. That, that's really for me to, to decide. I'm, I'm feeling piqued today about things. Uh, Christian followed by Sandra, followed by Elaine, Margaret, John, yeah. Finney, yeah. then Alison. Christian. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, my, my first question was a question, and, and um, you know, I would like to say as a 12 percent increase of uh, sexual crimes, which you talked about earlier on, it's one of the reasons why a lot of people who came in front of our committee said that it's not really the changes of the court services, but more the changes on, on, on uh, it's not even the increase of numbers of cases, but the complexity. Uh, of, of, of the cases, and, and I, I do agree with my colleague Rod, it, it is possible that in the year to come that complexity will still be there. So anything you could help, uh, and if you've got any plans in advance to, 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 to help on that particular point, we'd we'll be very welcome. I think it's, um, it's to be welcomed that there are more uh, sexual offence cases going to trial, um, domestic violence cases and also road traffic offences, and some of these issues reflect uh, uh, policing priorities, change of culture, the way in which the prosecutors are operating in terms of prioritising issues as well, um, uh, all of which have been uh, areas of importance both for the government and also for the police and their uh, prosecutors. So um, it's important that we, um, uh, that we respond to in-year uh, demands when they arise and um, uh, uh, we'll certainly remain uh, 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 engaged with the, the Justice Board to make sure that if there are issues... Uh, that require to be addressed in year that we uh, try to do so as quickly and as helpful as we can. Thank you for that answer. Uh, something else, Ross uh, talked about 
Uh, Ingrid Campbell talks about the bills, the VAT bill, but well, our bills as well, who seems to, uh, this one, are really unpaid bills who goes to the, uh, some event uh, of, of policing. And I would like to know more about it. I would like to know if you could help Police Scotland uh, to maybe uh, redefine that policy of recharging for particular events and how uh, you, uh, you, I would like you to, to, to understand the concern that Police Scotland has on, 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 on the stress on the budget on this, uh, on this uh, 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 policing event. Sorry. I think that's probably more a matter for the SPA than from government, because that, to me, um, I make an observation, cabinet secretary, would be government interfering in policing matters at a level that perhaps it shouldn't be. But uh, cabinet secretary, it's for you to. It is largely an operational matter. My understanding is that the uh, Scottish Police Authority approach is to um, is to recover costs which are associated with the policing of events. How they pursue that and take that forward is based in how their policy is around that issue. But my understanding is their objective is to achieve uh, cost recovery uh, uh, when they engage with uh, uh, organisations that, uh, 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 that are arranging events. Um, I think, am I right? Um, I'm trying to recall. My understanding is that they are not able to gain a profit from these types of issues. It has to be on a cost-neutral basis. So it would be about recovering costs which are associated with the policing of I think that from, event. Uh, I'm sorry, Cabinet Secretary, I think perhaps, it's just, but I think what we were told, perhaps you can confirm this, that where the, the event is profit-making, there's full cost recovery, but there are abatements, as we understand it, to be made if, there's, if it's for us, an amateur club against some professional body, and if it's not profit-making, there are no charges, but perhaps you would clarify, Hillary could clarify that for us. Please. Clarify a little further on that for you. Yes, certainly. The, the principle of full cost recovery is set out in Section 86 of the Police and Fire Reform Act. Um, so the Police Scotland is required to, to um, apply full cost recovery, and that is um, also set out in the Scottish Public Finance Manual. Right. Um, they then, th but that section also precludes um, any profit-making from the charges for those services. Um, However, the Police Scotland then have a, a process which includes the consideration of abatements of certain percentages of the full cost recovery dependent on the commerciality of the event. Uh, and that takes into account a range of considerations given that each event is unique. It's very important, and thank you for it, because it's a question of public confidence and particularly public expectation of what uh, the, the policy is for. And that leads me to, to my last question. Uh, we talked, uh, we heard that your uh, predecessor had some meetings uh, regarding the future of policing in 5, 15 years and 20 years' time. And uh, I would like to know uh, if, you, uh, if you're aware of these meetings and what do, do you think uh, uh, Police Scotland will look like in 5, 10 and, five, 10 and 15 years' time? And, and exactly uh, uh, if we're going to talk about sharing budgets uh, with uh, uh, sharing budgets, sharing maybe buildings, uh, with uh, uh, NHS, for example, or so, uh, social services? I suppose this is a dangerous question, and I've uh, been in the job for less than five days, and I'm uh, trying to predict what the police service may look like in 10 or 15 uh, years. I, I think what's extremely important, though, is that, um, you know, obviously, uh, with the um, moving to a single force, there's been a considerable level of consolidation taking place around uh, going from eight forces down to one force. And, uh, there is also uh, the transition which will be necessary and how the service has to move forward um, as it develops its own ethos and culture um, as an organisation. But I think within that, you also have to do the horizon scanning, thinking about what should the shape of policing be in uh, 10 or 15 years' time. Um, and, uh, for example, serious and organised crime in the past uh, probably didn't have things like cybercrime as being a high priority I would imagine now it is a high priority. Well, I know it is a high priority for them. So um, it's important they do that. Of course, for the, it is a matter for the, uh, uh, the SPA uh, to look at taking forward that type of work, um, which I understand they are doing, um, about what would the police service look like in 2026. 
Um, and I've asked my officials to keep me informed about uh, uh, the work that they're undertaking. But it is, it is a clear matter for the SPA to be looking at in terms of future proofing how they take the force forward in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Important, but that dialogue is seen as transparent, that people can see the, 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 the progress and the vision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sandra, followed by Elaine. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Designate. So it sounds like a presidential election, doesn't it? Designate. Uh, just one small, uh, you know, comment in regarding the VAT situation. And I'm pleased to see that you had said that there are, you know, letters, correspondence that I hope the committee will be able to get access to. I was just going to ask the, the, the Cabinet Secretary, designate, if the committee had agreed to perhaps asking a Treasury Minister to come before the committee to give evidence of why uh, they will not give the VAT to, to Scotland and the Scottish Parliament. Would that be one step forward from, obviously, the correspondence that's been sent? Well, I, I'm certainly convinced if it would be helpful, um, uh, able to ask for officials to make available what correspondence we have uh, from the Scottish Government's perspective, if that helps to... We just stop right there, because it's really a matter for the committee... Uh, to decide, so that would be very helpful. But I, yes, um, if throwing that out, basically, you've uh, done it. Of course, yes, yeah. I know it. It would be helpful, as the <laughs> cab sec said about the correspondence. Then hopefully that would lead up to, if the committee decides, uh, you so know, a treasury minister. So that would include. I just want to clarify: are all the communications with? I mean, some of it will be, I imagine, not in the public domain. Um, there may be issues about whether we have access to that by ask if we were to look at this the cabinet secretary to consider what else might be available that maybe has, has been confidential perhaps if it's confidential on both sides you can't disclose it without the agreement of the treasury i just put that to you as is everything that has gone on in the public domain well what, what i will do is i will uh, look at this with an open mind and what information we are able to provide to the committee on this matter including correspondence I'm more than happy for officials to look at making that available to you. Where it's not possible, um, um, then clearly we'll advise you of that. But I'm more than happy to, to, to uh, have an open mind in this issue to look at what information we can provide you with uh, regarding uh, our correspondence with the Treasury in this issue. I mean, I appreciate there may be some that's been agreed that would be confidential, yeah. may or may not. You have something else to ask? Yes, I did. <laughs> Thank you, Kintina. Thank you very much, Cabinet Sex. I was going to ask about uh, the purpose-built justice centres and obviously the evidence we've got the Scottish Court Service is basically desirable to move into these purpose-built uh, justice centres and I just wondered what uh, the Cabinet Secretary's thoughts are on the advantages of the purpose-built centres uh, and also the Scottish Court Centres mentioned the fact that obviously we need finance for that and how is the Scottish Government going to finance uh, these justice centres? Well, it's the 60 million. I may be wrong. I think there was evidence yes. that was 60 million set aside. In my yeah. yes. So, um, the, uh, obviously, it's a matter for the Scottish Court Service in taking forward the area around uh, configuration of their court services. Um, they are looking at the, uh, uh, the idea of three uh, 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 justice hubs uh, or centres um, uh, across the country. Uh, which would deal with um, uh, more serious uh, uh, criminal matters and civil issues um, uh, that could be referred to them. Uh, it is now for the Scottish Court Service to take the modelling that would be required for that type of work forward, to look at how that would fit within their overall court structure, uh, within uh, the present court estate, uh, and they would then have to bring forward a business case to the Scottish Government uh, in order to uh, make justification for that. What we have assigned is £60 million within the overall investment from the NPD uh, programme, uh, which would facilitate uh, the provision of uh, these uh, three centres. But it's, uh, it's work that the Scottish Court Service would need to take, take forward over the next couple of years uh, uh, and then to, to look at taking forward within the, the capital programme. But there has been an allocation set aside to assist with that. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to clarify that point. And the NPT is a non-profit-making 
we know what it is. I was just clarifying that point as well. Thank yes, you, thank you very thank much. You. Elaine, followed by Margaret, please. Uh, thank you and congratulations, Mr Matheson, on your designation. I think it's maybe not an appointment until it's gone through Parliament, but uh, thank you. Uh, congratulations anyhow. Can I push you just a little bit more on the pressures on the court service due to the complexity of work? Because we were told that there had been an overall 12% reduction in permanent staffing uh, by the FDA, uh, and also that there were reports of uh, serious cases, sheriff and jury and high court level cases being dated on the last date of service before the time bar. Uh, also that the summary courts are being staffed by newer and less experienced staff who are not having adequate um, uh, time for preparation of cases. I want to know that um, we are hearing that the, there is a possibility for application to the Justice Board for additional funding but that doesn't really address the retention of permanent, more experienced staff to deal with some of these complex cases. Is there not a, a case to be made for a permanent uh, alteration being made to the uh, court service budget to actually try and retain the sorts of staff that are needed for complex cases? Well, it would be for the Scottish Court Service to bring forward a proposal and justification for any additional resource that they required uh, to meet uh, ongoing demand within the system. Um, the additional resource that's been provided, the £1.47 million, which has been provided in year, um, a, a million pounds of that is going to the, the Scottish Court Service. The other uh, uh, 0.47 is going to the uh, uh, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service uh, for uh, uh, use of staff there. A large part from the discussion I've had uh, with uh, Eric McQueen, uh, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Court Service, is that a large part of that resource is for staffing purposes. Um, uh, in order to have uh, the right staff uh, available to undertake the additional work that is necessary. Um, if uh, there is an issue about uh, ongoing demand uh, within the Scottish Court Service that means that the existing budget allocation uh, or the use of their existing budget allocation um, is not sufficient to meet uh, demand within the Court Service, then I would expect either the Scottish Court Service um, to look at adapting their budget to reflect that or, of course, to have the discussion with their colleagues within the Justice Board around, uh, uh, around how they may wish to manage that going forward. Uh, we, of course, are uh, uh, stakeholders within that, and if there is, a, if there is a, an emerging long-term issue, then we will have to consider that, um, as in when the Scottish Court Service feel it's an issue that has to be brought to government. We uh, advised that there was over a 10% increase in, in course, uh, cases I think going to petition, I think they were called. Uh, the previous year, another 8% this year, so it does look to be a, a rising trend in more serious cases, which obviously are going to require more experienced staff in terms of taking them forward. I think, I think what's, um, you know, my, in my initial take on the, the, the justice portfolio in the, uh, the last couple of days, if I can say, is that um, I think what's extremely important is that we look at the whole justice pathway uh, from the point, uh, from the police right through to our prison system. I think historically there have been elements where it has operated in a disjointed fashion, um, which uh, my predecessor has taken a tremendous amount of work uh, forward in order to make it a much co more cohesive and interlinked, interoperational uh, type of system. Uh, and we can see the benefits of that. And part of that is that there are cases that some now reach trial that historically may never have got to trial. Uh, through some of the initiatives and work that have been taken forward. So um, I'm keen to make sure that we look at the whole justice pathway uh, from policing right through to the court system and through to our prison system uh, to make sure that we are reflecting the resource in a way that is meeting the demand that comes on the system at different points within it. And the Justice Board have clearly got a very important part to play in helping to shape that going forward. Thank you. Um, can I also ask you about the capital budget? Because we heard uh, last week from uh, organisations representing victims that uh, the courts still are inadequate in some cases for dealing with the needs of victims. Victims are still uh, coming into contact with offenders when they're going into court. There's problems with some of the IT and video conferencing links and so on. Are you confident there's sufficient uh, funds allocated to the capital budget of the court service to be able to iron out some of these problems and make the journey that victim in particular experiences going through the court system more appropriate? 
Well, I know over a number of years there's been a lot of work undertaken by uh, the court service in order to uh, provide different waiting areas for, uh, uh, for witnesses um, uh, and accused. So there's uh, been a lot of work undertaken over a, a, a number of years in order to achieve that. Um, I would expect the uh, Scottish Court Service to continue that work and to continue to look at their estate and how they can make sure that it is much more sensitive to the needs of different groups of who, individuals who are using our courts. Also about the agencies which they have there to help to support uh, victims of crime. Uh, within uh, the court environment. So, for example, some of the things that they're looking at around the idea of the, the justice uh, centres is about how they can bring together a suite of services. There's the court, but there's also the support services, uh, whether that be from benefit advice to, to uh, victim support, how they can deliver a much more holistic approach to justice in that type of uh, uh, environment. Um, and I would expect the Scottish Court Service to continue that process. I do understand that a key part of the capital expenditure that they have within the, uh, uh, the forthcoming budget is around ICT, uh, where they are, uh, have been making investment and uh, they are continuing to make investment. That will be around um, issues around video conferencing, um, uh, which, uh, for example, I, I, uh, my understanding is that for those courts which have already closed as part of their programme, video conferencing suites have been provided, although utilisation of them has been somewhat limited as yet, as we go forward with the Victims and Witnesses Act being much more fully implemented, then their use will grow. Um, so they've already started making that type of infrastructure investment, uh, and they're going to continue that type of infrastructure investment going. Uh, and the other part is the, uh, is the ICT uh, uh, system which they're using um, for uh, case management and for uh, uh, electronic uh, documentation uh, that can be transferred between uh, the courts, defence, prosecutors and the sharing of information as well. So a big part of what they are taking forward is around their ICT and it's a, it's a budget which reflects their priorities in the coming year and how they wish to take that forward. Thank you. Margaret, followed by John Finney, followed by Alison. Uh, uh, congratulations again on, on your, your new post, um, Thank you. Cabinet Secretary Desmond. Last week we took evidence both from the Procurator Fiscal Society and um, from the Crown and, and Procurator Fiscal Service, and I think it's fair to say that there was a bit of a disconnect between the two sources of evidence. I therefore very much welcome your initial approach um, to, to say that you'll look at the whole journey and, and where there may be some weaknesses. But if I could flag up two that I think maybe are, are important while um, it was acknowledged, I think, and I, I think it's difficult for, for people who are in um, the public service sometimes to be as forthright as they could be. There isn't maybe such a restraint on um, the society, but one of the disconnects came under the, the issue of lack of preparation time. You know, it was suggested, well, there's always lack of preparation time, but we get on with it. And I think from the society, the worrying thing was that, yes, there always has been, but now this is becoming the norm. And, and from that, there's problems with evidence, procedure, witness availability, and it's causing a delay in, in courts on this churn. So is this an area, um, Cabinet Secretary, that you, you would be prepared to look at, given there does seem to be a 1.1 million uh, reduction in, in the staffing budget for the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service? Well, the overall, the overall um, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Budget increases in real terms in the, the next budget. Um, in terms of how they then apply that uh, within, their, uh, uh, within their own department, within their service, is clearly a matter for the, uh, uh, for the Crown Office and the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General to determine how best to make use of uh, those uh, resources. We've recognised, for example, that... Uh, in uh, uh, this year alone, there has been additional demand placed on um, uh, our prosecutors, which is why they've uh, received part of the money in order to help to uh, meet the increasing demand of cases going to trial. They've been provided with the 0.47 uh, uh, million this, um, uh, uh, this financial year. Uh, but it is, of course, it, it is down to the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General to determine how they utilise the budget for their own staff. As I pointed out in my opening statement, um, 
uh, over the last, uh, since uh, uh, 08, 2008, there has been a 15% increase in the number of legal staff um, that are employed by our um, uh, Crown Office and Pro uh, Prosecutor uh, uh, PF service. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I, I also have to say these comments in that we are under tremendous pressure, uh, as the Crown Office and the justice system is no different from the rest of our public services, is that the UK government is currying the Scottish government budget, and we have to recognise that in how we manage our services. That's why reform is so important. So some of the work that I understand the Crown Office are taking forward, uh, uh, along with the Scottish Court Service, uh, is to make sure that we have much more effective systems around uh, witness management. So making sure that we have the right police officers there, that we have the right witnesses there at the same time, uh, that they've, got a, uh, they've taken forward the, the, the witness um, notification process, which has given them a, a reminder that you are due to uh, give evidence to try and reduce the possibility of no-shows, etc. So there's a range of things that you can do in terms of IT and policy and practice to try and help to make sure that when cases are due to go to trial, uh, that you try to get everyone there uh, that is meant to be there. And that, there is elements of work being taken forward in that. That will continue to be important. How that is determined uh, uh, and implemented is a matter for both the Crown Office and for the, uh, the court service. But um, you know, we have to be realistic, is that when uh, the UK government is cutting our budget, that we have to make sure that we try to protect to our services as best we can, but also at the same time make sure they're as efficient as they can uh, in order to help to uh, protect frontline services. Um, there are certainly very good things going forward. We heard about the um, Domestic Abuse Task Force, more complex cases, making sure every witness is seen, sometimes that involving travelling for procurator vehicles throughout the country. That's all good and that's all welcome. But there's a gap back in um, the bulwark service, and that's what's being highlighted. So I, I, I only ask that the, the, the new cabinet secretary designate um, does exact. Well, cabinet secretary designate does um, does keep an open does keep a, an open mind o on these things, given the importance of the Crown Procurator Fiscal. But if I could just press you particularly on the figures from June. 2004, which showed that 63% of sheriff and JP cases, um, only 63% were resolved from caution to verdict. Now that, um, in the 26-week target, that compares with 74% in September 2013. So when I fully acknowledge that court reform bill is being introduced to um, try and increase access to um, justice and to um, deal with some of these delays, court closures is having a negative impact. Will the Cabinet Secretary, with the, the programme closure um, coming to its end, comment on court capacity and have a look at maybe some of the court that are due to close? I think there's four due to close by January 2015 to see if this is a realistic prospect. I think it's uh, worth keeping in mind that the court closure programme was a programme that was brought forward by the uh, Scottish Court Service and um, it reflects how they feel they can best manage their estate. I, I also had a, a look at the evidence that Eric McQueen gave to the committee uh, and he uh, it was quite robust in that, in my view, around the issue whether the closure of the uh, courts is having an impact on delays in some business and other uh, areas within uh, uh, the court system and uh, from a discussion I've had with them that's not the case. Uh, it's uh, worth also keeping in mind that the uh, court closure programme uh, of which there have been two phases so far and the third phase will be in, uh, in January uh, only represents 5% uh, of uh, court work uh, and the Scottish Court Service um, are very clear that the physical estate which they have is sufficient to meet the demands uh, which are required within the court service in uh, it's Scotland. Uh, and uh, it, some of the in-year additional finance we've given them is to assist them with some of the cases that are now reaching trial, uh, are now reaching court, which are more complex, to assist them to actually have the additional staff that are required in order to meet that increasing demand which they face. Uh, but the Scottish Court Service uh, are very clear from the discussion I've had with them uh, that any delays that may have been experienced uh, anywhere in the system have not come about as a result of any court closures. 
uh, and that they are very confident that the existing quota state which they have is sufficient to meet the demand and the predicted demand going forward within the court service in Scotland. I think maybe further analysis on why there are um, less cases meeting the 26-week target would be welcome, and I think it's a combination of um, staffing in the Crown Fiscal Service and also the court closure. So I'd like to, to, to say that it was proved correct that the court closures weren't having an impact, but I rather fear they are, Cabinet Secretary. That wasn't a question, but is no, that, it wasn't. Is that you finished? There was a comment. I'm finished. You're finished. John Fiddy, followed by Alison McInnes. Thank you, Queen Erin. Congratulations, Mr Matheson. Mr Matheson, I'd like to, to ask about the budgetary implications of two manifesto commitments. They are the 1,000 additional officers and the environmental court. If we, if we take the officers first, please. I think you said, and the magic figure is 17,234, as you know, and I think the figure I noted you were saying was 17,267. And um, clearly, these additional officers will have contributed to the excellent figures that you reported and the, the, the growing confidence there is that the public have in the, in the way the police are going about their business. I just wonder if you have any plans to review the 1,000 additional officers, because there is a view that given the uh, staff percentage of overall costs that relate to staff costs and the percentage that is tied up in that, the fact that police officers cannot be made redundant, and the implications, although I don't share the common view about the, the what's the, the phrase, the, the balanced workforce, I think it, you need to have the right people to do the right job. Clearly, if, if I was a member of support staff, listening to radio adverts, encouraging people to apply to join the police, which are already in excess of that number, I would feel devalued. Have you any plans to try and reassure um, support staff, perhaps meet with them? So it is around any plans to review the thousand and I appreciate there's a general election coming, but of course there's a 2016 election after that. Any plans to review that at all, Kevin? So in short, no. Um, remain committed to the 1,000 extra officers uh, from our uh, 2007 uh, commitment. Um, and uh, I would expect both the uh, Police Scotland and the SPA to operate within uh, uh, that commitment. So uh, it remains a commitment which we are... Uh, 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 and I intend to take forward uh, as the new Cabinet Secretary. In relation to staff site and engagement with uh, stakeholders, um, uh, I uh, certainly intend to be as open as I can uh, with stakeholders, uh, staff side and uh, professional side as well. Um, uh, so I will certainly engage with uh, uh, staff side uh, organisations uh, uh, and uh, uh, professional organisations in a in an open way. Um, I will very much have an open door policy uh, for them to uh, engage with me. Uh, but I'm, um, uh, there are no plans, though, for us to uh, uh, change our position with regards to the thousand extra officers. Okay. Can I ask, in relation to the thousand officers, how will you answer the suggestion that, that is actually overt political interference? in police, uh, policing, because no one's going to refuse the additional resources, but clearly there are knock-on consequences of the requirement to maintain 17234. Well, my view is that um, uh, it's not interfering in operational issues. It's about the overall number of officers, um, uh, how they are deployed and how they are utilised uh, by uh, the police service is a matter for the police service. Uh, how they choose to configure the service is obviously a matter for the uh, Scottish Police Authority, but uh, in my view, we've got a very clear policy commitment uh, around the 1,000 extra officers, and um, I would expect that commitment to be maintained. Again, to push on the point, uh, Cabinet Secretary-designate, um, we did uh, hear from the, the Chief Constable earlier that there could be further staff um, um, support staff redundancies. There must come a point when the equation doesn't match up. So it's a matter for Police Scotland to determine how they configure their staffing levels. There was always an anticipated level of overlap with the merger of um, uh, eight forces in terms of uh, backroom functions that may have been undertaken by staff side. So there was always going to be a level um, of duplication. Uh, and clearly uh, that has to be addressed. We also have a policy of no compulsory redundancy uh, where uh, staff are able to get redeployed or uh, to go on to, different, uh, to work in a different field 
um, as well, or to take a, a voluntary uh, severance package if they choose to as well. But the, uh, the ultimate configuration of what's the uh, best way in which to use the staff resource uh, which uh, Police Scotland have is clearly a matter for both uh, Police Scotland and for uh, and for the uh, Scottish Police uh, Authority. Um, but I'm, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, always prepared to discuss with staff side some of the challenges which they face amongst their staff, and to, and I recognise some of the challenges which they uh, uh, face. Uh, but as a government, we also have a clear commitment which we uh, uh, we remain uh, committed to in terms of uh, numbers of policing, um, and we'll continue to pursue that policy. Okay, oh, thank you for that. Uh, on the question of the Environmental Court, and, and in a previous report, this committee has commended um, an environmental tribunal, that sort of uh, format. Um, the issue of uh, access to justice and the issue of com um, compliance with the Aarhus Convention um, have come up here repeatedly. Will you undertake to look at the issue of a, an environmental court tribunal in the very near future? Well, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always very open to looking at how we can improve access to our justice system uh, and in an appropriate way. I, I can recall, um, as you may recall yourself, there was a, a number of years ago a, a resistance to having an over-specialisation of courts um, uh, uh, because of the potential dilution that that could have on um, uh, uh, those who actually operate within them. And, Clearly, uh, uh, mindsets have changed in that. We now have much more in the way of specialist courts than we had historically. I think the first specialist court that I experienced was the drug court in Glasgow, uh, which was a, a very innovative approach. And when you witnessed it firsthand, you couldn't help but recognise the real value which it had. So I do recognise the importance that um, uh, different types of uh, specialist courts can have. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm open to looking at um, uh, how that can be taken forward in the future and what the shape of our specialist court should be in the future, including the issue of the, uh, uh, an environmental tribunal or court. Um, that's not to say that it's something that I would uh, automatically say would happen, but I'm open-minded uh, to considering it and uh, uh, whether it be appropriate and how it may fit within the, the Scottish justice system. OK, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you, John. Yeah. Uh, Alison, followed by John Pentland. Thank you very much, and my, uh, my congratulations to you, Mr Matheson. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we've heard a number um, of um, days of evidence from a range of people involved in policing um, about the challenges ahead in next year's budget. We've heard from the SPF, the ESPS, from the Inspector of Constabulary, from the Chair of the SPA, and indeed this morning from the Chief Constable, all warning that the next year's budget will be very challenging indeed. Um, when I pressed the Inspector of Constabulary on, on, on the risks ahead, he said it could impact on operational effectiveness if, if, if they weren't able to achieve the savings. We were also reminded this morning that ACPOS, although they were involved in drawing up the outline business case never actually agreed that the £1.1 billion worth of savings could be made. In light of that, um, will you commit to review the timetable for the reform um, to ensure that policing is not compromised by an unrealistic budget savings? I think, you know, from my perspective, is that uh, I fully recognise the pressures that different parts of the justice system in Scotland face because of the financial constraints in which we operate, because of the UK government cutting the Scottish government's budget. We have to operate within that framework. Uh, what we have to do is to make sure that our services are as efficient and effective as possible. And a big part of the work that my predecessor has undertaken is about trying to make the system much more efficient and effective which was one of the driving uh, forces behind moving to a single force in uh, Scotland. I think it should be acknowledged, though, that Police Scotland have undertaken a tremendous amount of work in achieving significant efficiencies. Um, uh, the last financial year, they achieved an efficiency saving of around £64 million. Pounds. Uh, they are uh, projecting to achieve that again this year. They are uh, well on track to um, uh, achieving the one point one billion pounds of uh, savings which we anticipate between uh, now and 2026. Uh, uh, and a key part of that is to be able to make sure that they are as efficient and effective as uh, possible. But all aspects of our public services are under pressure. Um, uh, justice is no different to health, to education, to uh, other areas of uh, public service. And what we need to do is to make sure that the way in which 
their police service is operating is as efficiently and as effective as possible. I recognise that there are challenges in being able to achieve these uh, uh, targets, and I would expect the uh, Chief Constable and uh, uh, the SPA to continue to look at how they can make the service more effective. Um, I think when you've got an organisation that employs some 23,000 people, uh, merging eight forces, uh, there are clearly still areas where I suspect there are efficiencies that can be gained um, around how the service uh, operates, and uh, I've got no doubt they will continue to do that. At the end of the day, obviously, chief constables have to make decisions around operational matters uh, and how they can best utilise their uh, service. And I would fully expect that if, um, if uh, uh, Police Scotland are looking to um, change how they deliver their services, that they would also anticipate what the outcome of that was before they even actually implemented any change as well. So there's a cause and effect approach that they uh, will clearly have uh, in their mind when they're looking at any changes to the service. But um, it is important that they are efficient and effective uh, and that they're able to operate within what is a, a constraining budget that, the, that our public finances face. And that's why reform is absolutely essential to make sure that we can protect those frontline services. If I might, Convener, um, I, I, I absolutely acknowledge the, the savings that they've made in the first couple of years. Um, those were um, in removing duplication and dealing with some of the efficiencies, as you say. Well, Vic Emery has said that we're moving now from that consolidating period to a more reforming period. Um, and the concern that I think there is within communities is that that reform is being driven by the budget pressure rather than taking communities with them um, and discussing it. Now, we've seen that the, the, some of the early decisions taken by Police Scotland um, did not have the support of the communities around Scotland. In moving forward to what might be more radical reforms, is it not important that sufficient time is given? Um, for those discussions and decisions to be made without being driven purely by the budget process? Well, efficiency is part of it, but it should be within the wider context of engagement with other, uh, engaging with other stakeholders. And um, uh, I, I can, I, from my own personal experience as a constituency MSP, uh, it would be fair to say I've actually found uh, my experience with my local commander, um, one which has actually been about uh, a considerable amount of engagement um, that was before I was even uh, Justice Secretary. So there's been a, a significant level of engagement. I've experienced that directly. That's not to say there isn't scope to improve it um, uh, and to look at how it can be added to going forward. And I do think when you go through a change process um, and, and communities are concerned about um, their local police station or the local officers and how the service will be configured and uh, their control centre, the call centre changes, it is extremely important that our police service um, uh, remain engaged with local communities. And that's why, um, uh, if there are ways in which that can be strengthened, uh, I'm open to looking at that and considering these matters. Um, are some of the things they're doing just now? So, for example, those are local policing plans for each of our 32 local authorities. We then have the much more granular policing plans that go right down to ward level, and there's, what, 353 of them across the country. Um, these are all right down to a granular level. Um, if there are ways in which we can make that work better, then I would uh, uh, be keen for the SPA and for Police Scotland to explore how that can be achieved. Um, because I do think as you transform and you change services, you must remain engaged with the community uh, and that they feel they are participants in that dialogue as well. And if there are ways uh, that we can build on what's happening at the present moment to make that better, uh, then I'm very open to that. And if members like yourself have got suggestions on how that could be achieved, I'm more than happy to have that discussion. Thank you. Well, that uh, concludes this, uh, your first evidence session of many to this magnificent Justice Committee. Uh, I'm going to, as we're moving on to a next item where the Cabinet Secretary-designate remains, I'm going to suspend for two minutes uh, while we allow officials to change. If you just bear with me, members, stay in your seats.
Uh, item three is consideration of an affirmative instrument, the Criminal Legal Aid Fixed Payments and Assistance by way of representation Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2014 draft. The Cabinet Secretary designated staying with us for this item and I welcome Government officials Denise Swanson, Head of Access to Justice Unit and Alistair Smith, Solicitor Director for Legal Services and um, you will be giving evidence, Cabinet Secretary, in advance of the... the um, debate on the censorship. This is an evidence session, so obviously officials can also be questioned, but I understand you also wish Cabinet Secretary to designate uh, to make an opening statement on the instrument. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, these regulations, the Criminal Legal Aid, Fixed Payments and Advice by Way of Representation, Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments, Regulations 2014, are the latest in a number of proposals to reduce the costs of legal aid fund uh, without the legal aid fund without affecting access to justice. We think it's reasonable that when solicitors dispose of cases prior to trial, their fees should reflect that the level of work required for clients is less than for cases taken to its conclusion through the courts. This is what these regulations will deliver in line with other fee regulations. For example, uh, the Criminal Legal Aid at Fixed Payments Scotland Amendments Regulations 2011 take a similar approach to ensuring that when cases are disposed of prior to trial, that fees reflect the lower level of work required. It's important uh, to note that these regulations are not just about uh, saving to the fund. Uh, the changes support consistency and simplicity and will be of benefit to solicitors, clients and the Crown. For example, in respect of preparation work for cases uh, continued without plea, uh, these regulations ensure that the preparatory work done by the solicitor is captured in the fee. That means that, should the case not be called, the solicitor will still be paid for the preparatory work undertaken. These regulations ensure that exceptional case status applies to all schedules of the Criminal Legal Aid Fixed Payments Scotland Regulations 1999. This will allow a solicitor to be paid detailed rather than fixed fees in certain circumstances where the work involved is well beyond that which was expected. The regulations would also encourage early resolution of cases through greater use of early pleas and negotiations which would be welcomed by the Crown. The Law Society of Scotland have been engaged in the development of these regulations and are, and are fully aware of their content. And I'm, as ever, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, Margaret? Um, Cabinet Secretary, you, you may be aware of a late submission from the Law Society which is um, expressing some concern over the provision on, I think it's juicy solicitors being paid a half fee if it's a not guilty verdict. And I think the nub of the whole thing is that um, as well as looking at the full fee, um, we wouldn't want to revert to a, a situation where a not guilty plea was tendered you know, just to make sure a fee was covered um, and then withdrawn at a later date. There's been a suggestion by the, the Law Society, therefore, that we maybe delay this to take, you know, some soundings on it, maybe to allow you to, to speak with them. Um, we don't have to agree it till the 12th of December, and I think you're coming back next week. That maybe give you some time, if you're not aware of this, to, to comment more fully on it. it I'm aware of it. Somewhat surprised, though, um, given that the Law Society have been fully engaged in the process of drafting this particular, uh, uh, this particular regulation. It seems a bit of a last-minute call on their part. Um, uh, the issue which they've highlighted is something which we've had dialogue on uh, within government. Um, uh, uh, notwithstanding what they've had to say, I'm uh, satisfied that the regulation and the consultation and the dialogue we've had with stakeholders has been sufficient to uh, continue to press ahead with the regulation. So, you, sorry, sorry, uh, you don't have any concerns that if this goes through, then you know, not guilty plea will, uh, or the guilty plea, whatever, would be delayed and, and not tendered to a later date? Well, I'm, I'm not overly concerned uh, about that matter because um, these are issues that were considered during the course of uh, the drafting of the regulation. Um, and uh, I'm, the reason I'm somewhat surprised is because the Law Society were engaged in that particular process and uh, uh, previously uh, uh, did not comment on this matter. So I'm, 
Uh, I must confess uh, a little surprise that, uh, that we received, I think, uh, just before five o'clock uh, last night, uh, a note from the Law Society that they have uh, apparently had a sudden change of heart. Sandra, then Roderick. I certainly wasn't aware of it until I came in this morning. It was sitting on my desk, and I've certainly this committee before, and uh, convener also has said that uh, most annoyed at certain aspects of late, you know, late submissions coming in. I mean, I'm reading the papers. I get them at the weekend. I've read through them. It says, you know, the law society, uh, the regulated representative body, they're all quite happy with the proposal. Then you come into committee, and it sits here in front. You hadn't even a chance to look at it. I mean, certainly, if they'd wanted to raise concerns, they could have raised concerns at the time. It's also went before the other committee, uh, which says that basically it's, all, all, it's went before the Delicate Powers and Law Reform Committee and says there's nothing there to raise any concern with this committee. And then we come in today and it's sitting on our desk and we want to delay it. I, for one, you know, basically I, I don't think we should because... We haven't. Not questioning it. Well, mean, you're, no. no, but I don't. We, we haven't accepted late submissions before, convener, uh, from witnesses. Right. So, so but you're, you're really more debating with each other here rather than Sorry, asking I'm the cabinet secretary, which but, yeah. makes your life nice and easy. But it's not. I'll take Alison and Roderick, then Elaine. Thank you. Well, I, thank you, convener. I'm, I'm not sure whether it's a change of heart or whether it's just a further scrutiny suggests that there's a little bit of the, le the regulation doesn't do what they thought it would do. Um, we, we're told that the auditor has found in favour of the Glasgow Bar Association, um, and I would like to um, learn a little bit more about that. Do you know if SLAB is going to lodge an objection to that decision? Yes, they are. They are. And that will then go to a sheriff. Uh, because the, uh, the ruling is on the basis that it's a, it's a matter of law that is to be determined. Um, and the only way that can be determined is for it to then be referred to a sheriff. And that's why it's been granted on that basis. So okay. uh, this, it's worth keeping in mind, th this doesn't actually change anything. It clarifies existing arrangements. Okay. Um, so it's not a, a major alteration as such uh, in any shape or fashion. Uh, and will uh, not have any significant impact that. So, uh, on, on practice in general. So... It is, um, it is it's purely clarifying what were previous regulations uh, around what were some uncertainty around them. You, you wouldn't think there's any benefit in waiting until that, that appeal has been, been heard? No, not from the advice I've been provided with, no. Thank you. No, it's on the draft. Sorry, I'm uh, Roderick. Uh, but, uh, to be honest, uh, Mr Matheson, that I was going to raise the issue with the SLAB's position as well, so it's rather been taken over by events, but... Um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll just leave it there, I think, for the moment. Oh, I was expecting some help here uh, to understand. I think, Aline, you come in. My, and my point was very similar to, to Alison's as well. I'm just not quite sure where it's a taxation. It seems to be a taxation decision rather than a legal decision. I, wasn't, I just wondered if anybody could clarify exactly what that had been. Yeah, I'll ask Diane to, yes. uh, to clarify that. Um, thank you, uh, Denise. Denise. Sorry, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> Steak. Uh, well, I have to say, your predecessor was very good at calling me Deirdre, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> One of those phases. OK, um, I think where we are with these, with these uh, regulations is we want to clarify what's current practice and current, clarify the policy that, that you know, where, where early pleas are tendered, this is for all cases, not cases just where there's a single charge. Um, the issue of taxation is that it's gone to the Auditor of Court because of that lack of clarity. And the Auditor has, in his, um, in his decision, said that he does not feel qualified to take a view on a matter of law, and that needs to go to Sheriff. Um, we know that there have been three previous circumstances in, in, in which this has gone to uh, a Sheriff, and on one of those, the Sheriff has held for the Solicitor and, and two for the Legal Aid Board. So we are really around cl clarification and simplification. In the majority of cases, solicitors accept that a half fee is the appropriate fee in these circumstances, and that's what they put in their accounts. Okay. I want to ask, because it says in the, the submission from the Law Society on the interpretation of the regulations, is this the current regulations? 
Right. So what changes in these regulations that would make... Let's say this was moved and passed today and there was a decision, uh, the objections went in, it went to the sheriff and the sheriff took a view on interpretation. Would it be of these regulations and would that decision therefore... I'm trying to understand whether it'd be a mistake to do this while something's being decided. It's my understanding that the sheriff will take a decision based on the, the 2011 regulations right. that, that, that stand. It, the, the decision will not be taken on the basis of revised regulations that we're putting forward today. Could I just ask a wee and what's the impact, excuse me just a minute, I've tried yeah. to understand this, what's the impact of the decision on the 2011 regulations on these draft regulations? Would there be any impact either way? The, the impact would be that we would see um, uh, no further need for future cases to go to taxation on the basis of clarification. As I say, the majority of cases don't go to taxation. Um, so let's no, just accept that. that. Yeah. Yes, Elaine. A point of clarification, really, to understand it, is that what you are proposing will actually clarify the situation so that in future there won't be this sort of dispute as to whether or not there should be taxation points. So actually, what you would be arguing is this, there would no longer be cases like this. Okay. So this clarifies the system. Uh, the only change is a change in fee level, uh, which you receive for the different stages. But that's, that's principally um, what it does. It clarifies existing regulations. Alice Roderick first. Wants I'll to take Roderick, because I haven't had Roderick yet. Just yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's really a, a matter of comment. I, I, perhaps I should refer to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates. But... Um, from the government's point of view, if we were not to take a decision on this today and to give us time to reflect on it, would that cause difficulties? It would continue uncertainty where we're trying to create clarification and certainty around the matter. For one week. I think the difficulty for there's a wee bit of a difficulty of giving it in understanding clearly what this happened. Mr Smith, are you coming to our rescue? Um, I'm coming to your rescue, perhaps to a very limited extent, um, which is in relation to the effect of the um, approval of these regulations on um, existing cases. Um, and that's just to draw the attention of the um, Committee to Regulation 2, um, which says that the regulations apply only in respect of proceedings commenced on or after the day in which they come into force. Um, so the effect of these regulations would be prospective, um, and the effect in terms of um, in terms of uncertainty, we think would be to remove the, the type of uncertainty to which the, um, the Law Society presently refers. So we think there would be an improvement in that, in that sense. Margaret? If I could absolutely clear, um, there's an appeal pending. If the appeal is lost and the taxation decision of the Glasgow Sheriff Court is upheld, does the Law Society's point still stand then? If we pass these regulations, I think I think we should ask. Will it have any can, can, can I can I respectfully mm. suggest because we don't want to get things wrong either for the Parliament or for the government, but it does seem that we don't fully. I'm speaking fully. Well, let me just say this. I put the except. You can correct me, but there is some confusion about what this impacts. Notwithstanding, it's late but we, there's some confusion about the impact of what this is. Um, does anybody, apart, I mean, would there be any harm in continuing this to next week so that we can fully consider what, what the impact is? Would there be any difficulty to the government? Do you, do you want to, I'm asking the cabinet secretary, it doesn't mean you have to, just would there be any difficulty? Then the committee can discuss whether it wants to do that. I mean, I'm, I don't understand what I'm being told, frankly. John? Please. Um, we have these proposals for new regulations. What happens, happens with the tax. It doesn't have any implication for... Yeah. Separate. Yeah. Separate matter. Yeah. Right. I'm not... I shouldn't be confused then. John? Christian? No, I, I, it was just a point saying that if it's only clarification, it doesn't change anything. I, I can't see any, any objection why we couldn't pass it today. I to say we believe that the implementation of these regulations should be delayed until the regulations have been assessed in the light of this taxation decision. They're wrong, are they? 
On our view, they've been consulted and engaged in the process as well um, in drafting these. And the issue about the tax case we've made is that uh, we'd be dealt with separately uh, from these regulations, convener. Yes. To the extent I can see why solicitors might not particularly want to get the half fee, uh, and that they may be making that argument. But quite honestly, I don't see what the problem is. Really, I mean, I, I think I feel it's been clarified. Okay. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, then I will. Have you any further questions on this? No. I then move to item four, the formal debate and the motion to approve the instrument considered under the previous item. I invite the Cabinet Secretary designated to move motion S4M11524. The Justice Committee recommends that the Criminal Legal Aid fix payments and assistance by way of representation Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2014 draft be approved. Moved. Do any member wish to speak in the debate on the motion? Uh, the question is that motion S4M11524 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her attending? And we are required to report an affirmative instruments. Are members content to delegate responsibility for me to sign off this report? Thank you. We now move into private session.